The Pillars of Creation by Terry Goodkind. Continuing on page 444. Sebastian, racing right along with her, had his sword out. A dozen of the big brutes were in front of her, led by Emperor Jagang himself. Behind were hundreds more of the grim assault force, all determined to deliver merciless violence to the enemy. Between her and those charging soldiers behind, Sisters of the Light ran up the steps, without weapons but for their gift. At the top of the flight of stairs, they all bunched to a halt on a slick oak floor. Emperor Jagang looked both ways down the hall. One of the panting sisters pushed through the men. Excellency, this makes no sense. His only answer was a glare as he caught his breath before his gaze moved, searching for his prey. Excellency, the sister insisted, if more quietly. Why would two people so important to their cause be alone here in the palace? Alone without even a guard at the door? It doesn't make sense. They would not be here alone. Jensen, as much as she wanted Lord Rahl under her knife, had to agree. It made no sense. Who says they're alone? Jagang asked. Do you sense any conjuring of magic? He was right, of course. They might go through a door and encounter a surprise of a thousand swords waiting for them. But that chance seemed remote. It seemed more logical that a protecting force, if there was one here, would not have wanted to allow them to all get inside. No, the sister answered. I sense no magic, but that doesn't mean it can't be called in an instant. Excellency, you are endangering yourself needlessly. This is dangerous to go chasing after such people when there are so many things about it that make no sense. She stopped short of calling it foolish. Jigang, seeming to pay minimal attention to the sister as she spoke, signaled to his men, sending a dozen racing off in each direction down the hall. A snap of his fingers and a quick gesture sent a sister with each group. You're thinking like a green army officer, Jigang said to the sister. The mother confessor is far more sly and ten times as cunning as you give her credit for. She is smarter than to think in such simple terms. You've seen some of the things she's pulled off. I'll not let her get away with this one. Then why would she and Lord Rahl be here alone? Jensen asked, when she saw that the sisters feared to speak up further. Why would they allow themselves to be so vulnerable? Where better to hide than in an empty city? Jagang asked. An empty palace. Any guards would tip us to their presence. But why would they even hide here of all places? Because they know that their cause is in jeopardy. They're cowards and want to evade capture. When people are desperate and in a panic, they often run for their home to hide in a place they know. Jagang hooked a thumb behind his belt as he analyzed the layout of halls around him. This is her home. In the end, it's only their own hides that they think of, not that of their fellow man. Jensen couldn't help herself from pressing, even as Sebastian was pulling her back, urging her to be quiet. She threw her arm out toward the expanse of windows. Why would they allow themselves to be seen then? If they're trying to hide as you suggest, then why would they let themselves be spotted? They're evil. He leveled his terrible eyes at her. They wanted to watch me find Brother Narev's remains. They wanted to see me discover their profane and heinous butchery of a great man. They simply couldn't resist such sick delight. But let's go he called to his men. As the emperor charged off, Jensen seized Sebastian's arm in exasperation, holding him back. Do you really think it could be them? You're a strategist. Do you honestly think that any of this makes sense? He noted which way the emperor went, followed by a flood of men charging after him, then turned a heated glare on her. Jensen, you wanted Lord Rahl. This may be your chance. But I don't see why... Don't argue with me. Who are you to think you know better? Sebastian, I... I don't have all the answers. That's why we're in here. Jensen swallowed past the lump in her throat. I'm only worried for you, Sebastian, and Emperor Jagang. I don't want your heads to end up on the end of a pike, too. In war, you must act, not only by careful plan, but when you see an opening. This is what war is like. In war, people sometimes do stupid or even seemingly crazy things... Maybe she and Lord Rahl have simply done something stupid. 
you have to take advantage of an enemy's mistakes. In war, the winner is often the one who attacks no matter what and presses any advantage. There isn't always time to figure everything out. Jensen could only stare up into his eyes. Who was she, a nobody, to try to tell an emperor's strategist how to fight a war? Sebastian, I was only... He snatched a fistful of her dress and yanked her close, his red face twisted in anger. Are you really going to throw away what might turn out to be your only chance to avenge your mother's murder? How would you feel if Richard Rahl really is crazy enough to be here? Or if he has some plan we can't even conceive of, and you just stand here arguing about it? Jensen was stunned. Could he be right? What if he was? There they are, came a cry from far down the hall. It was Jagang's voice. She saw him among a distant clot of his soldiers, pointing his sword as they all scrambled to turn a corner. Get them! Get them! Sebastian seized her arm, spun her around, and shoved her on down the hall. Jensen caught her footing and ran with wild abandon. She felt ashamed for arguing with people who knew what war was all about when she didn't. Who did she think she was, anyway? She was a nobody. Great men had given her a chance, and she stood around on the doorstep of greatness, arguing about it. She felt a fool. As they ran past tall windows, the very windows where the mother confessor and Lord Rawl had only moments before been seen, something outside caught her eye. A collective groan went up from beyond the panes of glass. Jensen slid to a stop, her hands out, gathering up Sebastian to stop him, too. Look! Sebastian glanced impatiently toward the others racing away, then stepped closer to look out the window as she shook her hand, frantically pointing. Tens of thousands of cavalrymen had formed up into a huge battle line across the palace grounds, stretching all the way down the hill, appearing to charge the enemy in a great battle. They all brandished swords, axes, and pikes as they rushed as a single mass, yelling blood-curdling battle cries. Jensen watched in stunned silence, seeing nothing yet for them to fight. Still, the men, raising a great cry, ran forward with weapons raised. She expected to see them run down the hill toward something out beyond the wall. Perhaps they could see an enemy approaching that she could not from her angle up in the palace. But then, in the middle of the grounds, with a mighty shock all along the line, there was a resounding crash as they met the wall of an enemy that was not there. Jensen couldn't believe her eyes. Her mind groped to reconcile it, but the terrifying sight outside made no sense. She wouldn't have believed what she was seeing were it not for the shock of sudden carnage. Bodies, man and horse, were rent open. Horses reared, others went down, tumbling over broken legs. Men's heads and arms spun through the air as if lopped off by sword and axe. All along the line, blood filled the air. Men were driven back by blows that exploded through their bodies. The dark and grimy force of Imperial Order cavalry was suddenly bright red in the muted daylight. The slaughter was so horrific that the green grass was left red in a swath down the hill. Where there had been battle cries, now there were piercing screams of appalling suffering and pain as men, hacked to pieces, limbs severed, mortally wounded, tried to drag themselves to safety. Out in that field, there was no such place. There was only confusion and death. Horrified, Jensen looked up into Sebastian's baffled expression. Before either could say a word, the building shook as if struck by lightning, Following close on the heels of the thunderous boom, the hall filled with billowing smoke. Flames boiled toward them. Sebastian snatched her arm and dove with her into a side hall opposite the window. The blast roared down the hall, driving chunks of wood, whole chairs, and flaming drapery before it. Fragments of glass and metal shrieked by, slicing through walls. As soon as the smoke and flames had rolled past, Jensen and Sebastian, both with weapons to hand, raced out into the hall, running in the direction Emperor Jagang had gone. Whatever questions or objections she had were forgotten. Such questions were suddenly irrelevant. It only mattered that, somehow, Richard Rahl was there. She had to stop him. This was finally her chance. The voice, too, urged her on. This time, she didn't try to put the voice down. 
This time she let it fan the flames of her burning lust for vengeance. This time she let it fill her with the overwhelming need to kill. They raced past tall doors lining the hall. Each of the deep-set windows that flashed by had a small window seat. The walls were faced with frame and panel wood, painted a shade of white warmed with a bit of rose color to it. As they came to the intersection of corridors and rounded the corner, Jensen didn't really notice the elegant silver reflector lamp centered in each of those panels. She saw only the bloody handprints smeared along the walls, the long splashes of blood on the polished oak floor, the disorderly tangle of still bodies. There were at least 50 of the burly assault soldiers scattered haphazardly down the hall, each burned, many ripped open by flying glass and splintered wood. Most of the faces weren't even unrecognizable as such. Shattered rib bones protruded from blood-soaked chain mail or leather. Along with the weapons that lay scattered, the hall was awash with gore and loose intestines, making it look like someone had spilled baskets of bloody dead eels. Among the bodies was a woman, one of the sisters. She had been nearly torn in two, as had been a number of the men, her slashed face set in death with a fixed look of surprise. Jensen gagged on the stench of blood, hardly able to draw a breath. As she followed Sebastian, jumping from one clear space to another, trying not to slip and fall on the human viscera. The horror of what Jensen was seeing was so profound that it didn't register in her mind. At least, it didn't register emotionally. She simply acted as if in a dream, not really able to consider what she was seeing. Once past the bodies, they followed a trail of blood down a maze of grand halls. The distant sound of men shouting drifted back to them. Jensen was at least relieved to hear the Emperor's voice among them. They sounded like hounds locked on the scent of a fox, baying insistently, refusing to lose their prey. Sir, a man called from far back through a doorway to the side. Sir, this way. Sebastian paused to look at the man and his frantic hand signals, then pulled Jensen into a resplendent room. Across a floor covered with an elegant carpet of gold and rust-colored diamond designs, past windows hung with gorgeous green draperies, a soldier stood at a doorway into another hall. There were couches like none Jensen had ever seen and tables and chairs with beautifully carved legs. While the room was elegant, it was not imposingly so, making it seem like a place where people might gather for casual conversations. She followed Sebastian as he ran for the soldier at the door on the opposite side of the room. It's her, the man called to Sebastian. Hurry, it's her. I just saw her pass by. The hulking soldier, still trying to catch his breath, sword hanging in his fist, peeked out the doorway again. Just before they reached him, as he peered down the hall, Jensen heard a dull thump. The soldier dropped his sword and clutched at his chest, his eyes going wide, his mouth opening. He fell dead at their feet, no sign of any wound. Jensen pushed Sebastian up against the wall before he could go through the doorway. She didn't want him encountering whatever had just dropped the soldier. Almost at the same time, from the way they had come, she heard the snapping hiss of something otherworldly. Jensen dropped to the floor, stretching out over Sebastian, holding him against the edge of floor and wall as if he were a child to be protected. She closed her eyes tight, crying out with fright at the thunderous blast behind her that shook the floor. A barrage of rubble shrieked through the room. When it finally went still and she opened her eyes, dust drifted through the destruction. The wall around them was peppered with holes. Somehow, she and Sebastian were not hurt. It only served to confirm what she already believed. It was him. Sebastian's arm shot out from under her to point across the room. It was him. Jensen turned but saw no one. What? Sebastian pointed again. It was Lord Rawl. I saw him. As he ran past the door, he cast in a spell of some kind, a pinch of sparkling dust, just as you pushed me against the wall. Then it exploded. I don't know how we survived in a room filled with such flying debris. I guess it all missed us, Jensen said. The room had been turned inside out. The draperies were shredded, the walls holed. The furniture that only moments before had been so beautiful was now a wreck of splinters and ripped upholstery. 
The rumpled carpet was covered in white dust, pieces of plaster, and splintered wood. A hanging chunk of plaster broke away and crashed to the floor, raising yet more dust as Jensen made her way through the wreckage of the room toward the door they had come through, the door where Sebastian had pointed, the door where only moments before Lord Rawl had been. Sebastian retrieved his sword and quickly followed her out. The hall, its woodwork so tastefully painted, was now smeared with blood. The body of another sister lay crumpled not far away. When they reached her, they saw her dead eyes staring up at the ceiling in surprise. What in the name of creation is going on? Sebastian whispered to himself. Jensen thought by the look on the dead sister's face that she must have wondered the same thing in the last instant of her life. A glance out the window showed a killing ground littered with thousands of bodies. You have to get the emperor out of here, Jensen said. This isn't the simple thing it appeared. I'd say it was a trap of some kind, but we might still be able to carry out our objective. That would make it a success, make it worth it. Whatever was happening was outside her experience and beyond her ability to comprehend. Jensen only knew that she intended to carry out her objective. As they raced down halls, chasing the sounds and following the trail of bodies, they worked their way deeper into the mysterious confessor's palace, away from any outside windows to where the air was hushed and gloomy. The deep shadows in the halls and rooms where little light penetrated added a frightening new dimension to the terrifying events. Jensen was well past shock, horror, or even fear. She felt as if she were watching herself act. Even her own voice sounded remote to her. In some distant way, she marveled at the things she did, at her ability to carry on. As they cautiously rounded an intersection, they encountered a few dozen soldiers hunched in the shadows just inside a small room, bloodied but alive. Four sisters were there, too. Jensen spotted Emperor Jagang leaning against a wall as he panted, his sword gripped tightly in a bloody fist. As she rushed up, he met her gaze, his black eyes filled not with the fear or sorrow she expected, but with rage and determination. We're close, girl. Keep that knife out and you'll get your chance. Sebastian moved off to check other doorways, securing the immediate area, several men moving at his direction when he gave them silent hand signals. She could hardly believe what she was hearing or seeing. Emperor, you have to get out of here. He frowned at her. Are you out of your mind? We're being cut to pieces. There are dead soldiers everywhere. I saw sisters back there ripped open by something. Magic, he said with a wicked grin. She blinked at that grin. Excellency, you have to get out of here before they have you, too. His grin vanished, replaced by red-faced anger. This is war. What do you think war is? War is killing. They've been doing it. And I intend to do it back twice over. If you don't have the guts to use that knife, then put your tail between your legs and run for the hills. But don't ever ask me to help you again. Jensen stood her ground. I'll not run. I'm here for a reason. I only wanted you out of here so the Order would not lose you too after they've already lost Brother Nariv. He huffed in disgust. Touching. He turned to his men, checking that they were paying attention. Half take the room on the right, just ahead. The rest stay with me. I want them flushed out in the open. He swept his sword before the faces of the four sisters. Two with them, two with me. Don't disappoint me now. With that, the men and sisters split up and quickly moved off, half through the room at the right, half charging after the emperor. Sebastian gestured urgently for her. Jensen joined him, running at his side, as they raced out into the smoky hall after the emperor. There he is, she heard Jagang call from up ahead. Here, this way, here. And then there was a thunderous blast so violent it took Jensen's feet from under her, sending her sprawling. The hall was suddenly filled with fire and fragments of every sort, rebounding off the walls as it all came flying toward them. Snatching her arm, Sebastian yanked her up and into a recessed doorway just in time to miss the bulk of the flying objects that came careening past. Men up the hall let out screams of mortal pain. Such unbridled wails sent shivers up Jensen's spine. 
Following Sebastian, Jensen ran through thick smoke toward the screams. The dark, in addition to the smoke, made it difficult to see very far, but they soon encountered bodies. Beyond the dead, there were still some men alive, but it was clear by the ghastly nature of their wounds that they would not live long. The last moments of their lives were to be spent in horrifying agony. Jensen and Sebastian scrambled past the dying through the carnage and rubble piled knee-deep from wall to wall, looking for Emperor Jagang. There, among the splintered wood, leaning boards, overturned chairs and tables, glass shards and fallen plaster, they spotted him. Jagang's thigh was laid open to the bone. A sister stood beside him, her back pressed to the wall. A huge, splintered oak board had been driven through her just below her breastbone, pinning her to the wall. She was still alive, but it was evident that there was nothing to be done for her. Dear Creator, forgive me. Dear Creator, forgive me, she whispered over and over through quivering lips. Her eyes turned to watch them approach. Please, she whispered, blood frothing from her nose. Please help me. She had been close to the Emperor. She had probably shielded him with her gift, deflecting whatever power had been unleashed and saved his life. Now she was shivering in mortal agony. Sebastian lifted something from under his cloak, behind his back. With a mighty swing, he brought his axe around. The blade slammed into the wall with resounding thunk and stuck. The sister's head tumbled down, bouncing through the dusty rubble. Sebastian yanked once, freeing his axe. As he replaced it in the hanger at the small of his back, he turned and came face to face with Jensen. She could only stare in horror into his icy blue eyes. If it were you, he said, would you want me to let you endure such suffering? Trembling uncontrollably, unable to answer him, Jensen turned away and fell to her knees beside Emperor Jagang. She imagined he had to be in frightening pain, but he hardly seemed to notice the gaping wound, except that he knew his leg wouldn't work. He held the two sides of the wound closed as best he could with one hand, but he was still losing a lot of blood. With his other hand, he had managed to drag himself to the side, where he leaned against the wall. Jensen was no healer and didn't really know what to do, but she did realize the urgent need to do something to stop the gushing blood. His face streaked with sweat and soot, Jagang pointed with his sword down a side hall. Sebastian, it's her. She was right here. I almost had her. Don't let her get away. Another sister, wearing a dusty brown wool dress, came clambering over the rubble, stumbling toward them in the darkness, passing all the groaning soldiers. Excellency, I heard you. I'm here. I'm here. I can help. Jagang nodded his acknowledgement, one hand resting on his heaving chest. Sebastian, don't let her get away. Move. Yes, Excellency. Sebastian took note of the sister climbing awkwardly over a broken side table, then pressed a hand to Jensen's shoulder. Stay here with them. She'll protect you and the Emperor. I'll be back. Jensen snatched for his sleeve, but he had already dashed away, collecting all the remaining men on his way past. He led them off down the hall, disappearing into the darkness. Jensen was suddenly alone with the wounded Emperor, a sister of the light, and the voice. She snatched up the end of a strip of a sheer curtain and pulled it out from under the rubble. You're losing a lot of blood. I need to close this as best I can. She looked up into Emperor Jagang's nightmare eyes. Can you help hold it closed while I wrap it? He grinned. Sweat coursed down his face, leaving streaks through the dusty grime. It doesn't hurt, girl. Do it. I've had worse than this. Be quick about it. Jensen started threading the filthy curtain under his leg, wrapping it around and under again as Jagang held the gaping wound closed as best he could. The fine fabric almost immediately turned from white to red with all the thick blood flowing across it. The sister put a hand to Jensen's shoulder as she knelt down to help. As Jensen continued wrapping, the sister laid her hands flat on each side of the massive gash in the meat of his thigh. Jagang cried out in pain. I'm sorry, Excellency, the sister said. I have to stop the bleeding or you'll bleed to death. Do it then, you stupid bitch. Don't talk me to death. The sister nodded tearfully, clearly terrified by what she was doing, yet knowing she had no choice but to do it. 
she closed her eyes and once more pressed trembling hands to Jagang's hairy, blood-soaked leg. Jensen pulled back to give her room to work, watching in the dim light as the woman apparently wove magic into the emperor's wound. There was nothing to see at first. Jagang gritted his teeth, grunting in pain as the sister's magic began to do its work. Jensen watched, spellbound, as the gift was actually being used to help someone instead of cause suffering. She wondered briefly if the Imperial Order believed that even this magic, used to save the life of the Emperor, was evil. In the murky light, Jensen saw the blood pumping copiously from the wound abruptly slow to an oozing trickle. Jensen leaned closer, frowning, trying to see in the shadows as the sister, now that the bleeding was nearly stopped, moved her hands, probably to start the work of closing the Emperor's terrible wound. Leaning close as she watched, Jensen heard Jagang suddenly whisper, There he is. Jensen looked up. He was staring off down the hall. Richard Rahl. Jensen, there he is. It's him. Jensen followed Emperor Jagang's gaze, her knife gripped in her fist. It was dark in the hallway, but there was smoky light down at the far end, silhouetting the figure standing in the distance, watching them. He lifted his arms. Between his outstretched hands, fire sprang to life. It wasn't fire like real fire, like the fire in a hearth, but fire like that out of a dream. It was there, but somehow not there. Real, but at the same time unreal. Jensen felt as if she were standing in a borderland between two worlds, the world that existed and the world of the fantastic. Yet the lethal danger that the wavering flame represented was all too clear. Frozen in dread, squatted down beside Emperor Jagang, Jensen could only stare as the figure at the end of the hall lifted his hands, lifted the slowly turning ball of blue and yellow flame. Between those steady hands, the rotating flame expanded to look frighteningly purposeful. Jensen knew that she was seeing the manifestation of deadly intent. And then he cast that implacable inferno out toward them. Jagang had said that it was Richard Rawl down at the end of the hall. She could see only a silhouetted figure casting out from his hands that awful fire. Oddly enough, even though the flame illuminated the walls, it left its creator in shadow. The sphere of seething flame expanded as it flew toward them with ever-gathering speed. The liquid blue and yellow flame looked as if it burned with living intent. Yet it was, in some strange way, nothing, too. Wizard's fire, the sister shrieked as she sprang up. Dear creator, no! The sister ran down the dark hall toward the approaching flame. With wild abandon, she threw her arms up, palms toward the approaching fire, as if she were casting some magic shield to protect them. Yet Jensen could see nothing. The fire grew as it shot toward them, illuminating the walls, ceiling, and debris as it wailed past. The sister cast out her hands again. The fire struck the woman with a jarring thud, silhouetting her against a flare of intense yellow light so bright that Jensen threw an arm up before her face. In a heartbeat, the flame enveloped the woman, smothering her scream, consuming her in a blinding instant. Blue heat wavered as the fire swirled a moment in midair, then winked out, leaving behind only a wisp of smoke to hang in the hall, along with the smell of burnt flesh. Jensen stared, thunderstruck by what she had just seen, by a life so cruelly snuffed out. Off down at the end of the hall, Lord Rahl again conjured a ball of the terrible wizard's fire, nursing it between his hands, urging it to grow and expand. Again, he cast it outward from lifted arms. Jensen didn't know what to do. Her legs wouldn't move. She knew she couldn't outrun such a thing. The howling sphere of roiling flame tumbled down the hall, wailing toward them, expanding as it came, illuminating the walls it passed, until the burning death spanned from wall to wall, from floor to ceiling, leaving no place to hide. Lord Rawl started away, leaving them to their fate, as death roared down on Jensen and Emperor Jagang. Chapter 49 the sound was horrifying. The sight of it was paralyzing. This was a weapon conjured for no reason but to kill. 
This was deadly magic, Lord Rawl's magic. This time there was no Sister of the Light to intercept it. Magic. Lord Rawl's magic. There, but not. In the last instant before it was on her, Jensen knew what she had to do. She threw herself over Emperor Jagang. In that fraction of a second before the fire was upon her, she covered him with her body where he lay at the edge of the floor against the wall, protecting him as she would a child. Even through her tightly closed eyes, she could see the brilliant light. She could hear the terrible wail of the tumbling flames howling around her. But Jensen felt nothing. She heard it roaring past her, thundering off down the hall. She opened one eye to peek out. At the end of the corridor, the orb of living fire exploded through the wall, coming apart in a shower of liquid flame, sending a hail of blazing wood out onto the lawn far below. With the wall gone, the hall was better lit. Jensen pushed herself up. Emperor, are you alive? She whispered. Thanks to you, he sounded stunned. What did you do? How could you not... Hush, she whispered urgently. Stay down or he'll see you. There was no time to waste. It had to be ended. Jensen sprang up and ran down the hall, knife in hand. She could now see the man standing there in the smoky light at the end of the hall. He had stopped and turned to stare back at her. As she raced toward him, she realized that it couldn't be her half-brother. This was an old man, a collection of bones in dark maroon and black robes with silver bands at the cuff of the sleeves. Wavy white hair stuck out in disarray, but did not diminish his air of authority. Yet he stared in shock at seeing her racing toward him, as if hardly believing it, hardly believing she had survived his wizard's fire. She was a hole in the world to him. She could see understanding flooding his hazel eyes. Despite his kindly look, this was a man who had just killed countless people. This was a man doing Lord Rawl's bidding. This was a man who would kill more people unless stopped. He was a wizard, a monster. She had to stop him. Jensen held her knife high. She was almost there. She heard herself screaming in rage like the battle cries she had heard from the soldiers as she plunged forward. She understood those battle cries now. She wanted his blood. No, the old man called to her. Child, you don't understand what you're doing. We don't have time. I don't have a moment to spare. Stop. I can't delay. Let me... His words were no more to her than those of the voice. She ran through the rubble littering the hall as fast as her legs would carry her, feeling the same sense of wild but deliberate fury she had in her house when the men had attacked her mother and then her, that same fierce commitment. Jensen knew what she had to do and knew she was the one to do it. She was invincible. Before she reached him, he cast one hand out toward her, but lower than he had before. This time, no fire erupted. She didn't care if it did. She would not be stopped. She could not be stopped. She was invincible. Whatever he did caused the debris at her feet to suddenly shift, as if he'd given the whole lot of it a mighty shove. Before she could jump clear, one foot tangled in the debris, breaking through the jumble of broken plaster and laugh. Rumpled carpeting and wreckage of furniture ensnared her ankle. With a surprised gasp, Jensen pitched violently forward. Pieces of wood and plaster flipped dust and debris up in the air as she crashed to the floor. Her face hit hard, stunning her. Small chunks and scraps rained down on her back. Dust slowly rolled away. Her face stung with dizzyingly intense pain. Jensen listened to the voice calling to her to get up to keep moving, but her vision had narrowed down to a tiny spot as if she were looking through a soft, fuzzy tube. The world looked dreamlike through that tunnel of sight. She lay still, breathing the settling dust until it coated her throat, unable even to cough. Groaning, Jensen was at last able to push herself up. Her vision was rapidly returning. She began coughing, hacking, trying to clear her windpipe of the choking dust. Her leg was jammed down among the tangle of debris. She was finally able to pry a board to the side, giving her room to pull her foot free. Fortunately, 
Her boot had prevented the splintered wood from slicing her leg. Jensen realized her hands were empty. Her knife was gone. On her hands and knees, she rummaged madly through the wreckage of wood, plaster, and tangled fabric of draperies, throwing things aside, searching for her knife. She thrust her arm under a nearby overturned table, groping blindly. With the tips of her fingers, she felt something smooth. She groped along it until she touched the ornately engraved letter R. Grunting with the effort, she shouldered the leg of the overturned table until the whole mess grated as it moved a little. At last, she was able to reach in far enough to pull her knife free. When Jensen was finally able to scramble to her feet, the man was long gone. She went after him anyway. When she reached the intersection of passageways, a quick look revealed only empty halls. She ran down the corridor she thought he had taken, looking in rooms, searching alcoves, making her way ever deeper into the murky palace. She could hear people in the distance, soldiers yelling for others to follow them. She listened for Sebastian's voice, but didn't hear him. She heard, too, the sound of magic being unleashed, like the crack of lightning, only indoors. It sometimes shook the entire palace. Sometimes, too, the screams of dying men could be heard. Jensen chased after the sounds, trying to find the man who had loosed the wizard's fire, but found only more empty rooms and passageways. Some places were littered with dead soldiers. She couldn't tell if they had been there from the first or had been left in the wake of the fleeing wizard. Jensen heard the sound of running soldiers, their boots rumbling through corridors, and then she heard Sebastian's voice call out, That way! It's her! Jensen raced for an intersection and turned down a hall running off in the direction she had heard Sebastian's voice. Her footfalls were muted by a long green carpet with gold fringe running the length of a grand corridor. It was all the more startlingly beautiful after coming out of ruined areas. A window overhead lit the variegated brown and white marble columns that supported arches to each side, like silent sentinels watching her race by. The palace was a maze of corridors and exquisite chambers. Some of the rooms Jensen cut through were lavishly furnished in muted tones, while yet others were decorated with carpets, chairs, and draperies in a riot of colors. She dimly noted that the grand sights were astoundingly beautiful as she concentrated on not getting lost. She imagined the place as a vast forest and noted landmarks along the way so as to find her way back. She had to help get Emperor Jagang to safety. Racing down the wide passageway lined with granite recesses in the walls to each side, each holding a delicate object of one kind or another, Jensen burst through double gold-bound doors into an enormous chamber. The sound of the doors rebounding echoed back from the room beyond. The size of place, the splendor of the sight, caught her up short. Overhead, rich paintings of figures in robes swept across the inside of the huge dome. Below the majestic figures, a ring of round windows let in ample light. A semicircular dais sat off to the side, along with chairs behind an imposing carved desk. Arched openings around the room covered stairways up to curving balconies edged with sinuous polished mahogany railings. Jensen knew by the imposing architecture that this must be the place from where the Mother Confessor ruled the Midlands. All the seating up in the balconies must have provided visitors or dignitaries a view of the proceedings. Jensen saw someone making their way among the columns on the other side of the chamber. Just then, Sebastian burst through another door not far to Jensen's right. A company of soldiers funneled through the doors after him. Sebastian lifted his sword, pointing. There she is! He was nearly out of breath. Rage flashed in his blue eyes. Sebastian! Jensen ran to his side. We have to get out of here. We need to get the Emperor to safety. A wizard came and the sister was killed. He's alone. Hurry! The men were fanning out a jangling dark mass clad in chain mail and armor and gleaming weapons spreading around the edge of the vast chamber like wolves stalking a fawn. Sebastian heatedly pointed his sword across the room. Not until I have her. Jagang will at last have the Mother Confessor. 
Jensen peered off to where he pointed and saw then the tall woman across the room. She wore simple, coarsely woven flaxen robes, decorated at the neck with a bit of red and yellow. Her black and gray hair was parted in the middle and cut square with her strong jaw. The mother confessor, Sebastian whispered, transfixed by the sight of her. Jensen frowned back at him. Mother confessor? Jensen couldn't envision the Lord Rawl wedding a woman as old as his great-grandmother. Sebastian, what do you see? He flashed a smug look. The mother confessor. What does she look like? What's she wearing? She's wearing that white dress of hers. His heated expression was back. How can you miss her? She's a beautiful bitch, a soldier on the other side of Sebastian said with a grin, unable to take his eyes from the woman across the room. But the emperor will be the one to have her. The rest of the men, too, started across the room with that same disturbing, lecherous look. Jensen seized Sebastian by the arm and yanked him around. No, she whispered harshly. Sebastian, it's not her. Are you out of your mind, he asked as he glared at her. Do you think I don't know what the mother confessor looks like? I've seen her before, the soldier beside him said. That's her, all right. No, it's not, Jensen whispered insistently, all the while tugging at Sebastian's arm, trying to get him to pull back. It must be a spell or something. Sebastian, it's an old woman. This whole thing is going terribly wrong. We have to get out. The soldier on the other side of Sebastian grunted. His sword clattered to the marble floor as he clutched his chest. He toppled like a tree that had been felled and crashed to the floor. Another soldier, then another, then another fell. Thump, 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 they hit the floor. Jensen put herself in front of Sebastian, throwing her arms around him to protect him. The room exploded with a blinding flash of lightning. The sizzling arc twisted through the air, yet it unfailingly found its mark, raking down the line of men running out around the edge of the room, cutting them down in an instant. Jensen looked over her shoulder and saw the old woman cast a hand out to the other side, toward men and a sister charging across the room straight toward her. The soldiers, struck down by an invisible power, dropped in their tracks one at a time. Their heavy, crumpled bodies slid across the slick floor a short distance when they collapsed in mid-stride. The sister cast out her hands. Jensen assumed to protect herself with magic of some kind, although she could see nothing of it. But when the sister again thrust out an arm, Jensen not only saw but could hear light forming at the tips of her fingers. With all the soldiers down, all but Sebastian dead, the old sorceress turned her full attention on the attacking sister. With weathered hands, the old woman warded the attack, sending the thrumming light back on the sister. You know you have but to swear allegiance, sister, the old woman said in a raspy voice, and you will be free of the dream walker. Jensen didn't understand, but the sister surely did. It won't work. I'll not risk such agony. May the Creator forgive me, but it will be easier for us all if I kill you. If that be your choice, the old woman rasped, then so be it. The younger woman started to cast her magic again, but fell to the floor with a sudden cry. She clawed at the smooth marble, trying to whisper prayers between grunts of terrible agony. She left a smear of blood on the marble, but before getting far, she stilled. Her head sank to the floor as she expelled one long, last, rattling breath. Knife in hand, Jensen ran for the murderous old woman. Sebastian followed, but had taken only a few steps when the woman wheeled and cast a shimmering light at him just as Jensen stepped into her line of sight. Only that prevented the streak of glimmering light from hitting him square. The light glanced off his side in a shower of sparks. Sebastian fell with a cry. No, Sebastian! Jensen started for him. He pressed his hands to the side of his ribs, clearly in pain. If hurt, at least he was alive. Jensen swung back to the old woman. She stood immobile, her head cocked, listening. There was confusion in her manner, and a curious kind of awkward helplessness. The sorcerer wasn't looking at her, but instead had an ear turned to her. Being a little closer now, Jensen noticed for the first time that the old woman had completely white eyes. Jensen stared, at first from surprise and then with sudden recognition. Addie, she breathed, 
not having intended to say it aloud. Startled, the woman cocked her head the other way, listening with her other ear. Who be there? The raspy voice demanded. Who be there? Jensen didn't answer for fear of giving away her exact location. The room had gone silent. Worry wore heavily on the old sorceress's weathered face, but determination, too, set her jaw as her hand lifted. Jensen gripped her knife in her fist, not knowing what to do. If this really was Addie, the woman Althea had told her about, then according to Althea, she would be completely blind to Jensen. But she was not blind to Sebastian. Jensen crept a step closer. The old woman's head turned to the sound. Child, do you be a sister of Richard? Why would you be with the Order? Maybe because I want to live. No, the woman shook her head with stern disapproval. No, if you be with the Order, then you have chosen death, not life. You're the only one intent on bringing death. That be a lie. All of you came to me with weapons and murderous intent, she said. I did not come to you. Of course, because you defile the world with your taint of magic, Sebastian called from behind. You would smother mankind, enslave us all with your wicked ancient ways. Ah, Addie said, nodding to herself. It be you, then, who has deluded this child. He's saved my life. Without Sebastian, I would be nothing. I would have nothing. I would be dead, just like my mother. Child, Addie said in a quiet rasp, that too be a lie. Come away from them. Come with me. You'd love that, wouldn't you? Jensen shrieked. My mother died in my arms because of your Lord, Rahl. I know the truth. The truth is that you'd love to deliver the prize plum to Lord Rahl at last. Addie shook her head. Child, I don't know what lies be filling your head, but I do not have the time for this. You must come away with me or I cannot help you. I cannot wait a moment longer. Time be in short supply and I have used all I have. As the woman spoke, Jensen used the opportunity to take small, quiet steps forward. She had to take this chance to end the threat. She knew she could take this woman out. If it was only a matter of muscle and skill with a knife, then Jensen would have the distinct advantage. A sorceress's magic was useless against someone who was invincible, against a pillar of creation. Jen, take her! You can do it! Avenge your mother! Jensen was still only a quarter of the distance from Sebastian to Addie. Knife held tight. She took another step. If that be your choice, Addie rasped at hearing the whisper of the footstep. Then so be it. When the sorceress lifted her hand out toward Sebastian, Jensen realized with horror what she meant. The price of her choice was that Sebastian would be forfeit. Chapter 50 Sebastian was on the floor, not far away, leaning to the side, propping himself up on one arm. Jensen saw blood on the marble floor under him. Since Addie couldn't stop Jensen, she intended to finish him as the price. The appalling reality of seeing Sebastian in pain, of knowing he was about to be murdered, shook Jensen to her very soul. Sebastian was all she had. The sorceress was but a blink away from loosing lethal magic on him. Jensen was a great deal closer to Sebastian than to the sorceress. Jensen knew she would never reach the sorceress in time to stop her, but she might make it to Sebastian in time to protect him. She could only kill the sorceress if she were willing to forfeit Sebastian to do it. That was the choice Addie had given her. Jensen abandoned her attack and instead dove for Sebastian, putting herself in the woman's line of sight, making a hole in the world where she was trying to aim her terrible conjured fire. The magic the sorceress loosed missed Sebastian, raking crackling lightning across the polished marble floor, ripping it up in a line right beside him. The air was filled with a burst of flying stone shards. Jensen scooped Sebastian protectively into her arms as she fell to his side. Sebastian, can you move? Can you run? We have to get out of here. He nodded. Help me up. His voice was labored, his breathing shallow. Jensen ducked her head under his arm and strained with the effort of lifting him to his feet. With her help, they hurriedly worked their way toward the door. 
Behind, Addie lifted her hands again, her white eyes tracking Sebastian's movements, if not Jensen's. Jensen twisted sideways, putting herself in the way. A blast of lightning laced past, missing them by inches, blowing the heavy metal-clad door off its hinges. The door went skittering down the hall. Jensen and Sebastian scuttled through the smoking opening and hastened down the wide hall. Jensen realized as she watched the heavy doors crashing down the hall, bouncing off walls, tearing out great chunks of stone, that if something like that hit her, she would be crushed. She noticed, too, that her arm was bleeding from small cuts from the stone shards that had struck her. It wasn't magic that had done it, but sharp stone even if the sharp stone had been sent flying by magic. She might be in some ways invincible, but if magic toppled a massive stone column on her, she would be just as dead as if it had been pushed over by brute strength instead. Dead was dead. Jensen suddenly didn't feel so invincible. At the first intersection, she took them to the right, getting Sebastian out of the line of sight of Addie's gift and her weapons of magic as quickly as possible. Jensen could feel his warm blood running over the arm she had around him. Despite his injury, Sebastian didn't ask her to slow to spare him any pain. Together they rushed through halls and rooms as fast as he was able, crossing the palace, going back toward where Jensen had left the emperor. Are you hurt bad? she asked, fearing the answer. Not sure, he said, nearly out of breath and clearly in pain. Feels like there's a fire burning in my ribs. If you wouldn't have prevented her from hitting me square on, I'd be dead for sure. As they moved through the palace, they came across a squad of their men. Jensen collapsed next to them, panting, exhausted, unable to hold Sebastian up another step. Her leg muscles trembled from the exertion. We're leaving, Sebastian told the men, his breathing labored with pain. We have to get out. The emperor is hurt. We have to get him out of here. He motioned in different directions. Some of you go each way, collect all our men. We need to get everyone we can to protect the Emperor, and then we have to get him back to safety. You two, you'll have to help me. The bulk of the men immediately rushed off to their tasks. The two remaining behind threw Sebastian's arms over their shoulders and easily lifted him. He winced in pain. Jensen led them through the palace, watching for the landmarks she remembered, desperate to reach Emperor Jagang and to get out of the death trap of a palace. The Confessor's Palace was a confusion of halls, passageways, and rooms. Some of the rooms were huge, but when they came to such places, they went around, staying to the maze of passageways. Sebastian said they didn't want to be caught in one of those big rooms where they would be an easier target. Intermittently, Jensen heard the awful thump of magic. Each time, the entire palace shuddered with the concussion. This way, she said recognizing the yawning breach in the wall at the corner of a passageway strewn with rubble. That gaping hole through the outer wall, looking out to daylight and overlooking the lawns far below, was where the wizard's fire, meant for her and Emperor Jagang, had blasted through. Five soldiers made their way down the hall from the other direction, climbing over the tangled debris, bringing a sister of the light with them. From behind, nearly a dozen more men appeared. Two sisters, their faces streaked with soot, came through a nearby room to the side, followed by yet more of the assault force. Half the men were bleeding, but all of them were able to move under their own power. Emperor Jagang was sitting up against the wall where Jensen had left him. The deep, jagged gash was partly being held together by the curtain Jensen had wrapped around his leg, but the meat of his muscle wasn't aligned properly, and the terrible wound clearly needed attention. It appeared that the healing magic performed by the sister just before she had been killed still held, and at least the emperor wasn't still losing blood the way he had been. The blood the emperor had lost left him weak-looking and pale, but not as pale as the faces of those who for the first time saw the seriousness of his injury. One of the sisters knelt down to check his wound. Jagang winced when she tried to better align the two halves of his split leg. There's no time to heal it now, she said. We'll need to get him to safety first. She immediately set to tightening the bandage of blood-soaked curtain that Jensen had started to apply. She snatched up more cloth from the rubble. Did you get her? Jagang asked as the sister worked at pulling the injury closed with the filthy strip of cloth. Where is she? Sebastian! 
He used a board to lever himself upright, peering this way and that around the company of soldiers as they helped Sebastian make his way through to the emperor. There you are. Where's the mother confessor? Did you get her? It isn't her, Jensen answered in his place. What? The emperor glanced around angrily at the people watching him. I saw the bitch. I know the mother confessor when I see her. Why didn't you get her? You saw a wizard and a sorceress, Jensen told him. They were using magic to make you think you were seeing Lord Rawl and the Mother Confessor. It was a trick. I think she's right, Sebastian put in before Jagang could scream at her. I was standing right beside her, and while I saw the Mother Confessor, Jensen didn't. Jagang turned a dark scowl on her. But if the others saw her, how could you not? Understanding seemed to come over him. For some reason that Jensen couldn't exactly fathom, he suddenly recognized the truth in her words. But why? The sister tending the emperor's injury asked, looking up from her work of bandaging the wound. Both the wizard and the sorceress seem to be in a hurry, Jensen said. They must be up to something. It's a diversion, Jagang whispered, staring off down the empty hall littered with rubble. They wanted to keep us occupied, keep us away, and busy thinking about something else. Keep us away from what? Jensen asked. The main force, Sebastian said, catching Jagang's line of thought. Another sister, casting surreptitious glances to the other sisters after inspecting Sebastian's wound, worked quickly at pressing a padded bandage against his ribs and then wrapping a long strip of cloth around his chest to hold it in place. This will only help for a short time, she muttered half to herself. This is not good. She glanced again to the other sister. We're going to need to tend to this. We can't do it here. Sebastian winced in pain, ignoring her, then spoke. It's a trick. They keep us here, puzzling over where they could be, kept us chasing after illusions while they attack our main force. Jagang growled a curse. He looked off out the hole the wizard's fire had blasted in the wall, peering out toward the army they had left a long ride back down the river valley. He clenched his fist and gritted his teeth. That bitch! They wanted us busy so our main force would be sitting in place while they attack. That filthy, scheming bitch. We have to get back. The small force moved quickly through the halls. Jagang was carried with a man under each arm, as was Sebastian, so that they could make quick progress back out of the confessor's palace. Sebastian was looking worse. Along the way, they gathered up more of their men. Jensen was astounded that there were still any others alive. Compared with the force they had come in with, though, they had been cut to pieces. Had they all stayed together, rather than the way the Emperor and Sebastian continually divided them up, they might have all been killed at once. As it was, the Order would still have to leave behind a great many dead. Once on the lower level, they worked their way along service halls toward the side of the palace, Sebastian advising that it would be best not to go out by the main entrance where they had entered, for fear that such a move might be expected, and they very well could be struck down before they could get away. Everyone moved as silently as possible through the empty kitchens, emerging to a gray day in a side courtyard. It was secluded, with a wall screening it off from the city. The sight as they came around the side of the palace was horrifying. It looked like the entire force had been cut down, that none of the cavalry could possibly still be alive. Jensen couldn't stand the sight of so much carnage, yet it was so overwhelming that she could not look away. The dead, horses as well as men, lay tangled in a ragged line down the hillside, fallen in the place where they met the foe head-on at a full charge. In the distance near the trees, a few scattered horses, their riders no doubt dead, nibbled at the grass. There are no enemy dead, Jagang said, surveying the sight as he limped along with the aid of a pike a soldier had handed him. What could have done this? Nothing living, a sister said. As they moved quickly down the hill, making their way past the silent battle line, not far in front of the heaps of corpses, Others of the cavalry, far down the slope on the other side of a wall in an area among small garden buildings and trees, spotted the emperor and raced out to protect him. Soldiers on horseback, numbering less than a thousand out of the over 40,000 they started with, swept in to surround the company returning from the palace. A number of the sisters rode in, 
pulling in close to the Emperor to provide an inner circle of defense. Rusty, trailed by Pete, trotted across the lawns, accompanying the tattered remnants of the cavalry. When Jensen whistled, Rusty recognized the call and rushed in to be close to her. The mare, nuzzling Jensen's shoulder, voiced a plaintive whinny, eager for comfort. Rusty and Pete weren't cavalry horses, trained to be accustomed to the terrors of war. Jensen ran a soothing hand over the horse's trembling neck and rubbed her ears. She gave similar comfort to Pete when he pressed his forehead against the back of her shoulder. What happened? Jagang called out in a rage. How could you let yourselves be taken like this? The officer leading the men on horseback looked around in dismay. Excellency, it was out of the clear air. It wasn't anything we could fight. Are you trying to tell me it was ghosts? Jagang bellowed. I think it was the horses the scout smelled, another officer said. His arm was bandaged up high but soaked in blood. I want to know what's going on, Jagang said as he glared around at the faces watching him. How could this have happened? As men brought extra horses, Sister Perdita dismounted close by. Excellency, it was some kind of attack involving magic. Phantom horsemen invoked by wizardry is the only explanation I have. His menacing eyes were leveled at her in a way that made even Jensen quail. Then why didn't you and your sister stop it? It wasn't anything like the conjured magic we ordinarily encounter. I believe it had to be a form of constructed magic, or we would have not only detected it, but been able to stop it. At least, that's what I assume. I've never actually seen any constructed magic, but I've heard of it. Whatever this was that attacked us would not respond to anything we tried. The Emperor was still frowning darkly at her. Magic is magic. You should have stopped it. That's what you are here for. Constructed magic is different than conjured, Excellency. Different how? Rather than using the gift on the spot, constructed magic has already been made up in advance. It can be preserved for a great period of time thousands of years, maybe even forever. When it's needed, the spell is triggered and the magic is loosed. Triggered by what? Sebastian asked. Sister Perdita shook her head in frustration. By just about anything, as I've heard it told. It just depends on how it was constructed. No wizard now is able to construct such a spell. We know little about those ancient wizards or what they could do, but from what little we do know, a constructed spell could be something kept dry that comes to life when you get it wet. For example, something to help fertilize crops when the spring rains come. It could be triggered by heating, like a cure taken for a fever. The cure carries a construction in, and the fever triggers it. Others are triggered by a little magic, some by an elaborate application of incredibly intricate wizardry and great power. So, Jensen reasoned, Someone with magic must have unleashed something so powerful as these phantom horsemen? A wizard or a sorceress or something? Sister Perdita shook her head. It could be that kind of constructed magic, but it could just as easily be a spell, albeit an incredibly powerful one, kept in a thimble and triggered by exposing the construction to anything. Horse dung, even. Emperor Jagang waved off the very notion. But something that small and easily triggered wouldn't be this powerful. Excellency, the sister said, in this you can't equate the apparent material size of the construction or its trigger with the result. They have no relational value, at least not in the terms in which most people think. The trigger has no bearing on the power of the construction. Even the construction and its trigger are not necessarily relational. There is simply no rule by which to judge a construction. The emperor swept an arm out before the tens of thousands of men and horses tangled in death. But surely something of this magnitude had to have been something more. The army of phantom horsemen who carried out this attack might have been triggered by a wizard drawing spells in magic dust while speaking an incredibly complex invocation, or it could just as easily have been a book containing a cavalry counter that is simply opened to the proper page and held out before the attacking force, even from miles away. Even the simple fear of a person holding out such a construction could be the trigger. You mean anyone 
might accidentally trigger one then? Jensen asked. Of course, that's what makes them so dangerous. But from what I've read, that kind is exceedingly rare. Because they can be so dangerous, most are layered in complex precautions and fail-safe mechanisms involving the most profound knowledge of the application of magic. But, Jensen asked, once a person, a wizard, with that advanced knowledge removes those layers of precautions and fail-safe mechanisms, then they might be set off by one final simple trigger? Sister Perdita gave Jensen a meaningful look. Exactly. So, Jagang said, gesturing around at the thousands of bodies, this force of phantom cavalry might be sent out again at any moment to finish us off. The sister shook her head. As I understand it, a constructed spell is usually good only once. It's used up by doing what it was constructed to do. That's one reason they're rare. Once used, they're gone forever, and there are no longer any wizards alive who can make more. Why haven't we encountered such constructed spells before? Sebastian asked with growing impatience. And why now all of a sudden? Sister Perdita stared at him for a moment, a picture of bottled anger that Jensen knew she would never have dared direct at the Emperor, even though the attack on the Confessor's palace, which he ordered against her warning, had resulted in the deaths of many of her sisters of the light. With a show of deliberate care, Sister Perdita pointed up at the dark keep hard against the mountain above them. There are a thousand rooms in the wizard's keep if there's one, she said in a low voice. A good many of them will be stuffed full of nasty things. It's likely that when we drove them here for the winter, that wizard of theirs, Wizard Zorander, finally had the good long time he needed to search through the keep, looking for just the kinds of things he hitherto lacked so as to be ready for us when spring arrived and we advanced toward Aidendrill. I fear to think what catastrophic surprises he yet has in store for us. That keep has stood invincible for thousands of years. Sebastian's glare turned as dark as Jagang's. Why haven't you warned us about this? I never heard you say anything. I did. You were gone. You've also advised against many other things as well, and we've overcome them, Jagang growled at her. When you fight a war, you must expect to take risks and to take casualties. Only those who dare win. Sebastian gestured up at the keep. What other things might we expect? Constructed spells are only one of the dangers in fighting these people. None of us sisters really considered constructed spells a great threat because they're so rare. But as you can see, even one constructed spell is profoundly perilous. Who knows what even more deadly things might be waiting to be unleashed. What's more, there's a whole world of dangers we can't even begin to conceive of. Their winter weather alone has killed hundreds of thousands of our men without the enemy having to lift a finger or risk a single man. That alone has done more damage to us than almost any battle or calamity of magic. Did we expect such losses from something so simple as snow and cold weather? Did our size and strength protect us from it? Are those hundreds of thousands any less of a loss because they died of fever rather than some fancy application of magic? What difference does it make to the dead or those left to fight? I admit to a soldier winning because your enemy falls ill might not seem very glamorous or heroic, but dead is dead. Our army outnumbers these people many times over, yet we lost those hundreds of thousands to fever because of simple weather, not the magic you are so worried about us protecting you from. But in a real fight, Sebastian scoffed, then our numbers really mean something and will win out. Tell that to those who died of fever. Numbers don't always determine the winner. That's outlandish, Sebastian shot back. Sister Perdita pointed at the line of dead. Tell it to them. We must take risks if we're to win, Jagang said, settling the matter. What I want to know is if the enemy can be expected to throw more of these constructed spells at us. Sister Perdita shook her head as if to say she had no idea. I doubt that Wizard Zorander knows much about the constructed spells kept there. Such magic is no longer understood well. He apparently understood one of them pretty well, Sebastian said. And that might have been the only one he understood well enough to use. As I said before, once used, 
constructed spells are used up. But it's also possible, Jensen interrupted, that there are more constructed spells he does understand. Yes, or for all anyone knows, this could have been the last constructed spell in existence. On the other hand, he might be sitting in there with a hundred of them in his lap, all much worse than this one. There is simply no way to know. Jagang's black eyes gazed out at his fallen cavalry elite. Well, he certainly used this one to cut. There was a sudden blinding flash off at the horizon. The world around them lit with the intensity of a flash of lightning, but the flash didn't die out as lightning did. Jensen seized the reins just under Rusty and Pete's bits to keep them from bolting. Other horses spooked, rearing up. White-hot light flared up from the river valley down over the hills in the direction of the army. The light was so white, so pure, so hot, that it lit the clouds from underneath all the way to the opposite horizon. It was a light of such power, such intensity, that many of the men dropped to a knee in alarm. The incandescent glow expanded outward with incredible speed, dwarfing the hills, yet it was so distant that they heard nothing. The rocky slopes of the mountains ringing the city were all illuminated in the harsh glare. And then Jensen heard at last a deep rumbling boom that vibrated in her chest. It shook the ground beneath their feet. The powerful resonant boom stretched out into a growing clacking roar. A dark dome expanded up through the light. Jensen realized that because of the distance, what looked to her like a spreading dome of dust had to be debris at least as big as trees or wagons. As the dark cloud expanded upward through the light, it dissipated, as if evaporating in the might of that consuming heat and light. Jensen could see a wave, like the rings made by tossing a rock in a pond, radiating outward, except this was a single wave racing across the ground. As everyone stood transfixed, gripped in fright, a sudden wall of wind, driving dirt and sand before it, blasted up the hill toward them. It was the shock of the wave that had finally reached them. It was so abrupt and so powerful that if the branches were not already bare, they would have been stripped of leaves right then and there. Limbs snapped as trees shuddered under the concussion of wind. More horses panicked, bucking and bolting. Men dropped to the ground to protect themselves from what might come next. Jensen, staggered by the blast of wind, shielded her eyes with a hand while huge soldiers recited prayers learned in childhood, begging the Creator for salvation. Jagang stood facing the sight with angry, defiant challenge. Dear spirits, Jensen finally said, squinting, blinking the dust from her eyes as the aftermath seemed to abate. What could that have possibly been? Sister Perdita had gone ashen. A light web. Her voice was low and heavy with what Jensen had never detected from her before. Dread. Impossible, Emperor Jagang roared. There are sisters down there warding for light spells. Sister Perdita said nothing. She couldn't seem to take her gaze from the arresting sight. Jensen could tell that the pain was wearing heavily on Sebastian, but he spoke forcefully. I've been told that a light web can't do any more damage than... He gestured back at the palace. Perhaps to destroy a building. Sister Perdita said nothing, and with that silence offered the evidence to the contrary that was clearly before his eyes. Jensen took the reins to both horses in one hand and put the other to Sebastian's back in sympathy. She ached for him and wanted him to be somewhere safe where his injury could be tended to. The sisters had said that it was serious and needed their attention. Jensen suspected that the wound he suffered at the hands of the sorceress needed the intervention of magic. How can it be a light web? Jagang demanded. There's not even anyone here. No troops, no army, no force, except maybe a couple of their gifted. That's all it would take, Sister Perdita said. Such a thing needs no supporting troops. I told you that something was wrong. With the keep here in Aidendril, there's no telling what even a lone wizard might be able to do to hold off an army, even our army. You mean, Sebastian asked, 
It's like the way a small force in a high pass, for example, can hold off a whole army. That's right. Jagang looked incredulous. You mean to say that you think that even that one skinny old wizard in a place like the Keep might be able to do all that? Sister Perdita's gaze shifted to the Emperor. That one skinny old wizard, as you call him, has just managed to do the impossible. He has not only found what was probably a light web constructed thousands of years ago, but even more inconceivable, he somehow managed to ignite it. Jagang turned to stare off to where the light was finally dying. Dear Creator, he whispered, that's right where the army is. He wiped a hand back across his shaved head as he considered the frightening implications. How could they ignite a light web among our army? We're warded for that. How? Sister Perdita's eyes turned toward the ground. There is no way for us to tell, Excellency. It could be something as simple as a box containing an ancient light web from which he removed all the fail-safes and then left it for us to come across. As our men set up camp, maybe a man found it, wondered what was in the innocent-looking little box, opened it, and the light of day was the final trigger. It could be something else entirely that we could never begin to dream up or imagine, much less forestall. We'll never know. Whoever triggered it is now part of that cloud of smoke hanging over the river valley. Excellency, Sebastian said, I urgently advise that we get the army out of here, move them back. He paused to wince in pain. If they're able to unleash such a defense with all the gifted and their protection we have, then taking the keep might be impossible. But we must, Jagang roared. Sebastian sagged forward, waiting for a stitch of pain to pass. Excellency, if we lose the army, then Lord Rahl will triumph. It's as simple as that. Aiden Drill is not worth the risk it has proven itself to be. This was not so much the Sebastian Jensen knew as it was Sebastian, the Order's strategist, speaking. Better for us to withdraw and fight another day on our terms, not theirs. Time is our ally, not theirs. In silent fury, the Emperor stared off toward his imperiled army as he considered Sebastian's advice. There was no telling how many men had just died. This is Lord Rao's doing, Jagang finally whispered. He has to be killed. In the Creator's name, he must be killed. Jensen knew that she was the only one who could accomplish such a thing. Chapter 51 Jensen paced in the dimly lit tent, her footsteps silent across the Emperor's opulent carpets. A sister stood vigil near the outer entry, making sure that no one could come into the tent to disturb the Emperor, or, more important, to harm him. Outside, a massive contingent of guards, including more sisters, patrolled the area. Occasionally, the sister over by the outer entry glanced at Jensen as she paced. Pacing was all she could do. Her insides were a painful knot of worry over Sebastian. He had lost consciousness on the long ride back to the encampment. Sister Perdita said that he was in danger of losing his life. Jensen couldn't bear the thought of losing him. He was all she had. Emperor Jagang was also in grave condition after having lost so much blood and then having to endure the long, hard ride back with the tattered remnants of the elite cavalry, but he'd refused to delay his return for any reason, even his own well-being. He never thought of himself, only of getting back to his army. Both men were at last now secure in the confines of the Emperor's tents, being attended to by Sisters of the Light. Jensen had wanted to stay with Sebastian, but the sisters chased her out. The Emperor had been made worse by the sight of the army. He'd been fit to kill anyone who gave him an excuse. Jensen could understand his rage of emotion. The light web had ignited close to the center of the encampment. Even this many hours after the event, the place was still mass confusion. Many units had scattered, preparing for the possibility of an imminent attack. Others, it was suspected, had simply run for the hills. In the area where the light web had ignited, there was nothing but a vast depression of blackened ground. In the ensuing chaos, no one had been able to determine how many men had been killed. 
it was next to impossible, with so many either killed or scattered, to get an accurate count of units, much less individuals. But there was no argument that the devastation was staggering. Jensen had overheard whispers of over half a million men turned to dust in an instant, and maybe as many as twice that number. In the end, the number killed might prove to be much higher. There were inestimable numbers of seriously injured soldiers, men burned or blinded, men severely cut or with limbs taken off by flying debris, men partially crushed by heavy wagons and equipment toppling on them, men made deaf, men so insensate, so stupefied, that they could only stare unblinking at nothing. There were not enough army surgeons or sisters of the light to even begin to attend to the tiniest fraction of the wounded. With every hour that passed, thousands of those who survived the initial blast died of their injuries. As staggering a blow as it was, it was not fatal to the great beast of the Imperial Order Army. The encampment was immense, and precisely because it was so vast, much of it had survived. According to the Emperor, it was only a matter of time before they replaced the dead with fresh troops, and then he would unleash his men to seek vengeance on the people of the New World. Jensen was beginning to understand why Sebastian had always been so adamant that all magic must eventually be eliminated. There was no good that she could think of that could offset such wickedness. She hoped magic could at least spare his life. Despite Emperor Jagang's conviction that their forces would soon recover, there were difficult times ahead for them. Much of the food had been destroyed, along with vast amounts of equipment and weapons. Every tent in the entire encampment had been at least knocked down. It was a cold night, and many men would be exposed to the elements. Fortunately, even though the emperor's tent had been flattened, men had been able to erect it again for the injured emperor and Sebastian. Jensen paced, burning, not only with worry, but with rage. She doubted that a greater monster than Richard Rawl had ever lived. Surely no single man had ever been the cause of so much suffering in the world. It was inconceivable to her that anyone could have such a lust for power that they would lead a cause that could murder so many people. She didn't see how Richard Rawl could be a part of creation. Surely he was the keeper's disciple. Tears ran down Jensen's cheeks at her gnawing apprehension. She prayed fervently to the good spirits that Sebastian would not die, that the sisters could heal him. In agonizing worry, she halted in her pacing and leaned on a table she had not seen the last time she had been in the tent. When the tent had fallen, it had been hastily erected, and this table, probably from the emperor's private quarters, apparently hadn't been replaced in its proper location. There was a small bookcase at the rear of the top. Looking for something that might divert her mind from the ache of anxiety while she waited for word of Sebastian, Jensen idly scanned the old books. She didn't understand the words on any of them. For some reason, though, one in particular drew her attention, something about the rhythm of the foreign words. She pulled the book out and turned it toward the candlelight, trying to read the title. She ran her fingertips over the four gilded words on the cover. They made no sense to her, yet they seemed somehow almost familiar. Jensen gasped in surprise when the sister, who had been over by the door, lifted the book from her hands. These belong to Emperor Jagang. Besides being very old and very fragile, they are quite valuable. His Excellency doesn't like anyone to touch his books. Jensen watched the woman inspect the book for any damage. I'm sorry, I meant no harm. You are a very special guest, and we have been instructed to accord you every privilege but these are His Excellency's most prized works. He is a man of great learning. He collects books. As a guest, I think you should respect his wishes that no one but he touch them. Of course, I didn't know. I'm sorry. Jensen chewed her lower lip as she looked back at the curtain drawn across the doorway to the back where Sebastian was being seen to. She wished there would be some word. She turned back to the sister. I was only puzzled because I've never seen such words. These are in the tongue of the Emperor's homeland. Really? Jensen gestured to the book the sister was returning to its place. Do you know what it says? I don't know the language very well, but... Let me see if I might be able to tell. In the dim light, 
The sister squinted at the book for a time, her lips moving silently as she worked at the translation, before finally sliding the volume back in place. It says, The Pillars of Creation. The Pillars of Creation? What can you tell me about such a book? The woman shrugged. There's a place in the old world called by that name. I would guess the book must be about that. Before Jensen could ask anything else, Sister Perdita suddenly emerged from behind the rear partition of the tent, the candles casting harsh shadows across her somber face. Jensen rushed to meet her. How are they? she asked in an urgent whisper. They're both going to be all right, aren't they? Page 479. Sister Perdita's gaze shifted to the sister who had just replaced the book. Sister, you are needed by the others. Please go help them. But His Excellency told me to guard. His Excellency is the one who needs the help. The healing is not going well. Go and help the sisters. At that, the woman nodded and rushed off to the back. Why isn't the healing going well? Jensen asked after the sister had vanished behind the heavy curtain. A healing that is started and then interrupted as Emperor Jagang's was, creates unique problems, especially since the sister who started it is dead. Each person brings unique ability to the task, so to go in later and try to unravel exactly how it was started, much less build on it, makes the healing much more difficult and delicate. She offered a small smile. But we're confident that His Excellency will be fine. It's just a matter of some concentrated work by the Sisters of the Light. I imagine they will be at it most of the night. By morning, I'm sure everything will be under control and the Emperor will be as strong as ever. Jensen swallowed. What about Sebastian? Sister Perdita appraised her with a cool, unreadable look. I would say that depends on you. On me? What do you mean? What do I have to do with healing him? Everything. But what is it you could possibly need from me? You have but to ask. I'll do anything. Please, you must save Sebastian. The sister pursed her lips as she clasped her hands. His recovery hinges on your commitment to eliminating Richard Rahl. Jensen was baffled. Well, yes, of course, I want to eliminate Richard. I said commitment, not words. I need more than mere words. Jensen stared a moment. I don't understand. I've traveled a long and difficult journey to come here so that I might secure the help of the Sisters of the Light, so that I can get close enough to Lord Rahl to put my knife in his heart. Sister Perdita smiled that terrible smile of hers. Well, then, if that's true, then Sebastian should have nothing to worry about. Please, Sister, just tell me what it is you want. I want Richard Rahl dead. Then we share the same goal, if anything. I'd venture that I feel more strongly about it than you ever could. One of the sister's eyebrows lifted. Really? Emperor Jagang said that the sister who was trying to heal him up in the palace was killed by wizard's fire. That's right. And did you see the man who did it? Jensen thought it strange that Sister Perdita didn't ask how it was that she wasn't also killed by the wizard's fire. He was an old man, skinny, with wavy white hair sticking out in disarray. First wizard, Zedicus Zul Zarander, the sisters said in a venomous hiss. Yes, Jensen said. I heard someone call him Wizard Zarander. I don't know him. Sister Perdita glared. Wizard Zarander is Richard Rahl's grandfather. Jensen's jaw dropped. I didn't know. Yet here was a wizard doing all this damage, nearly killing Emperor Jagang and you, who claimed to be so committed failed to kill him. Jensen held her hands out in frustration. But, but I tried, I did. He got away. There was so much going on. And you think it will be easier to kill Richard Rahl? Words are easy. When it comes to true commitment, you couldn't even stop the threat from his doddering old grandfather. Jensen refused to allow herself to fall to tears. It was a struggle. She felt foolish and shame. But I... You came here for the help of the sisters. You said you wanted to kill Richard Rahl. I do, but what does that have to do with Sebastian? Sister Perdita held up a finger, commanding silence. Sebastian is in grave danger of dying. 
he was struck by a dangerous form of magic cast by a very powerful sorceress. Those shards of magic are still in him. Left alone, they will shortly kill him. Please, you must hurry then. An incensed expression silenced Jensen. That magic is also dangerous to us, to those trying to heal him. For us sisters to attempt to remove those embedded shards of magic endangers our lives as well as his. If we are to risk the lives of sisters, then I want in return your commitment to kill Richard Rahl. How could you place a condition on the life of a man? The sisters straightened with contempt. We will have to let many others die in order to devote the necessary numbers and time to healing this one man. How dare you ask that of us? How dare you ask us to let others die so that your lover might live? Jensen had no answer to such a terrible question. If we are to do this, then it must be for something worth more than those lives that will be lost without our help. Helping this one man must count for something. Would you expect less? Would you not want the same? In return for us saving this man so dear to you, he's dear to you too, to the Imperial Order, to your cause, to your Emperor. Sister Perdita waited to see if Jensen would now be silent. When Jensen's angry gaze faltered and finally sank, the sister continued. No one individual is important except for what value he can contribute to others. Only you can provide that value for him. For us saving this man so dear to you, I must have in return your unqualified commitment to stopping Richard Rahl once and for all, your material commitment to killing him. Sister Perdita, you have no conception of how much I wish to kill Richard Rahl. Jensen's hands fisted at her sides. He ordered the murder of my mother. She died in my arms. His rule resulted in Emperor Jagang nearly being killed. Richard is responsible for hurting Sebastian, for suffering beyond any imagining, for murders beyond estimate. I want Richard Rahl dead. Then let us free the voice. Jensen stepped back in shock. What? Grushdeva. Jensen's eyes went wide at encountering that word aloud. Where did you hear that? A self-satisfied smirk settled comfortably on Sister Perdita's face. From you, dear? I never... At dinner with His Excellency, he asked you why it was you wished to kill your brother. What was your reason, your purpose? You said, Grushdeva. I never said any such thing. The smirk soured to condescension. Oh, but you did. Are you going to lie to me? To deny that word has been whispered in your mind? When Jensen stood silent, Sister Perdita went on. Do you know what it means, that word, Grushdeva? No, Jensen said in a very small voice. Vengeance. How do you know? I know that tongue. Jensen stood rigid, her shoulders drawn up. What is it exactly you are proposing? Why, I'm proposing to save Sebastian's life. But what else? Sister Perdita shrugged. Some of us sisters will take you out to a quiet place where we can be alone, while some of us stay here and save Sebastian's life like you want. In the morning, he will be better, and then you and he can be on your way to kill Richard Rahl. You came here for our help. I am proposing to give you that help. With what we do for you, you will be able to accomplish your task. Jensen swallowed. The voice was strangely silent, not a word. It was somehow more awful that it was silent right then. Sebastian is dying. He has only moments before it will be too late for us to save him. Yes or no, Jensen Rao. But what if... Yes or no, your time has run out. If you want to kill Richard Rahl, if you want to save Sebastian, then utter but one word. Do it now, or forever wish you had. Chapter 52 After they picketed their horses, Jensen gave Rusty a rub on the forehead. With trembling fingers, she smoothed her other hand along the underside of the jaw as she pressed the side of her face against the horse's nose. Be a good girl until I get back, she whispered. 
Rusty neighed softly in response to the gentle words. Jensen liked to imagine that the horse could understand her words. From the way her goat, Betty, had always cocked her head and stilled her little upright tail as Jensen confided her innermost fears, she had firmly believed that her hairy, four-legged friend could understand every word. Jensen peered overhead at the claw-like branches, swaying in the muted light of a full moon, occulted by a milky veil of ethereal clouds drifting across the sky, as if gathering to bear silent witness. Are you coming? Yes, Sister Perdita. Hurry then, the others will be waiting. Jensen followed the woman up the side of a bank. The mossy ground was littered with leathery dried oak leaves and a layer of small branches. Roots emerging here and there from the loose loam provided enough footing to climb the steep rise. At the top, the ground leveled out. The sister's dark gray dress made her nearly vanish as she moved into the thick brush. For a woman with such big bones, Jensen noticed that the sister moved with disturbing grace. The voice remained silent. In tense times like this, the voice always whispered to her. Now it was silent. Jensen had always wanted the voice to leave her be. She had come to understand just how frightening such silence could be. The full moon being only thinly obscured provided enough light to make her way. Jensen could see her breath in the cold air as she followed the sister into the thick of the woods back between the low spreading boughs of balsams and spruce. She had always felt at home in the woods, but somehow following a sister into the woods didn't give her the same comforting feeling. She would rather be alone than in the company of the stern woman. Ever since Jensen had given her the only word that would save Sebastian's life, Sister Perdita had settled into a demeanor of blunt superiority devoid of any tolerance. She was now firmly in command and was certain that Jensen knew it. At least she had kept her word. As soon as Jensen had given hers, Sister Perdita had urgently set other sisters to saving Sebastian's life. While other sisters were sent on ahead to prepare whatever it was they had to prepare, Jensen was allowed to briefly look in on Sebastian to reassure her that everything possible to save him was being done. Before she had left his side, Jensen had bent and softly kissed his beautiful lips, run her hand tenderly back over his white spikes of hair, and gently brushed her lips across both his closed sky-blue eyes. She had whispered a prayer for her mother with the good spirits to watch over him. Sister Perdita had not stopped her or hurried her, until at the end when she pulled Jensen back and whispered that the sisters, huddled all around him, had to be left to do their work. On her way out, Jensen had been allowed to put her head into the private chamber of the Emperor and saw four sisters bent close over his injured leg. The Emperor was unconscious. The four sisters working feverishly on the Emperor seemed to be in pain themselves, sometimes putting their hands to their heads in agony. Jensen hadn't known, until she saw the four and Sister Perdita explained, just how unpleasantly difficult healing could be. The sisters were not concerned, though, about the life of the Emperor being in immediate danger, as they were about Sebastian. Jensen held a balsam bough back out of her way as she followed the sister deeper into the forbidding wood. Why do we have to go so far from the camp? Jensen whispered. The horseback ride had taken what seemed hours. Sister Perdita's tail of hair fell forward over her shoulder when she looked back, as if it were a particularly inane question. So we can be alone to do what must be done? Jensen wanted to ask what must be done, but she knew the sister wouldn't tell her. The woman had turned away all questions with answers that were no more than general. She said that Jensen had given her word, and now it was her duty to uphold her end of the bargain, to do as she was told until it was finished. Jensen tried not to think about what might be ahead. She put her mind instead to thinking about leaving in the morning with a healthy Sebastian, about being back out on the trails, out in the countryside, away from all the people, away from the grim-looking soldiers of the Imperial Order. She knew that the soldiers were doing an invaluable job fighting against Lord Rahl, but still, she just couldn't help the way those men made her skin crawl. She felt as nervous as a fawn being watched by a pack of drooling wolves. Sebastian just didn't understand, whenever she'd tried to put it into words for him. He was a man. 
She supposed he couldn't understand what it felt like to be leered at. How could she make him understand that it was especially daunting to be watched by men such as those, men with such lecherous grins and savage eyes? If she just did as Sister Perdita said, then, by morning, she and Sebastian could leave. With whatever help the sisters were planning, they had at least assured her that she would be better able to kill Richard Rawl. That was all Jensen cared about now. If she could at last kill Lord Rawl, then she would be free. Her life would be her own. And if that much never came to be for herself, at least the rest of the world would be safe from a butcher of momentous proportions. They had left the horses among trees with bare branches, oaks mostly. Since the trees had yet to leaf out, the forest had at first been open, but they moved steadily into thicker woods of balsam, spruce, and pine, many with thick boughs skirting their trunks all the way to the ground. Although the soaring pines had no lower branches, their spreading crowns sealed off the weak moonlight. Jensen followed behind the sister, watching her glide deeper into the silent, gloomy wood. Jensen had spent much of her life in forests. She could follow the trail left by a chipmunk. Sister Perdita was moving with all the certainty of someone following a road, yet there was no trail Jensen could detect. The ground was covered with the typical forest litter. None of it had been moved by anyone's passing. She saw twigs lying undisturbed, dried leaves intact, delicate mosses that were untouched by any boot. For all Jensen could tell, she and the sister were making their way through virgin woods without any reason or destination, yet she knew by the deliberate way the sister moved that she had to have one, even if only she saw it. And then Jensen caught a faint sound drifting through the thick woods. She saw a blush of light on the underside of branches ahead. The chill air had an odd, unpleasant cast, like the faint scent of rot, but with a sickening sweet trace to it. As she followed Sister Perdita through thick, tightly spaced evergreens, Jensen began to hear the individual voices joined in a low, rhythmic, guttural chant. She couldn't understand the words, but they resonated deep in her chest, and the unusual cadence being disturbingly familiar in the back of her mind. Even without her hearing the individual words, the cant of them almost seemed to be what lent the stench to the air. The words, peculiar yet hauntingly intimate, cramped her stomach with nausea. Sister Perdita paused to look back to make sure that her charge wasn't flagging. Jensen could see the faint moonlight reflecting off the ring through the sister's lower lip. All the sisters wore one. Jensen found the custom revolting, even if it was to show loyalty. When Sister Perdita held a low balsam bough aside for her, Jensen stepped through. Hearing the voices in chant beyond had her heart hammering. She could see through the gap a clearing in the forest, allowing an open view of the sky and moon overhead. Jensen glanced at the sister's stern expression, then continued on to the brink of the clearing. Before her lay a broad circle of candles. The candles were placed so close together that it almost looked like a ring of fire invoked to hold back demons. Just inside the candles, a circle had been made on the bare ground with what looked like white sand that glimmered in the moonlight. All around, just inside the circle made with the same strange white sand, were geometric symbols Jensen didn't recognize. Seven women sat in a circle inside the sparkling sand. There was one place where it looked like someone belonged but was missing, no doubt Sister Perdita. The women had their eyes closed as they chanted in the strange language. Moonlight reflected off the rings through their lower lips as they spoke the grating guttural words. You are to sit in the center of the circle, Sister Perdita said in a low voice. Leave your clothes here. Jensen looked over into her hard eyes. What? Remove your clothes and sit in the center, facing the breach in the circle. The command was spoken with such cold authority that Jensen knew that she had no choice but to obey. The sister took her cloak, then watched silently. After her dress slipped to the ground, Jensen hugged her goosebump-covered shoulders. Her teeth chattered, but it was more than from just the cold. Seeing the sister's silent glare, Jensen swallowed in revulsion and then hurriedly took off the rest of her things. 
Sister Perdita prodded her with a finger. Go. What is it I'm doing? Jensen's own voice sounded surprisingly powerful to her. Sister Perdita considered the question for a moment before finally answering. You are going to kill Richard Rao. To help you, we are breaching the veil to the underworld. Jensen shook her head. No. No, I'm not doing any such thing. Everyone does it. When you die, you cross the veil. Death is part of life. In order for you to kill Lord Rahl, you are going to need help. We are giving you that help. But the underworld is the world of the dead. I can't... You can and you will. You have already given your word. If you don't do this, then how many more will Lord Rahl go on to murder? You will do this, or you will have the blood of each of those victims on your hands. By refusing, you will be invoking the death of countless people. You, Jensen Rahl, will be aiding your brother. You, Jensen Rahl, will be throwing open the doors of death and allowing all those people to die. You, Jensen Rahl, will be the Keeper's disciple. We are asking you to have the courage to reject that and to turn death instead on Richard Rahl. Jensen shivered, tears running down her face as she considered Sister Perdita's terrible challenge, her terrible choice. Jensen prayed to her mother, asking what she should do, but no sign arrived to help her. Even the voice was silent. Jensen stepped over the candles. She had to do this. She had to end the rule of Richard Rahl. Thankfully, the center of the whole careful arrangement at least looked dark. Jensen was mortified being naked in front of strangers, even if they were women, but that was the least of her fears at the moment. As she stepped across the circle of glimmering white sand, it felt frighteningly colder, as if she were stepping into the grip of living winter. She shivered and shook, hugging herself, as she made her way to the center of the circle of women. In the middle was a grace made of the same white sand, sparkling in the moonlight. She stood staring down at it, a symbol she herself had drawn many times, but her hand was not guided by the gift. Sit! Sister Perdita said. Jensen started with a gasp. The woman was standing right behind her. When she pressed on Jensen's shoulders, Jensen sank to the ground, sitting cross-legged in the center of the eight-pointed star in the center of the grace. She noticed then that each of the sisters sat at the extension of a ray coming from each point of the star, save one directly in front. That spot was empty. Jensen sat naked, shivering in the center of the circle as the Sisters of the Light began their soft chanting again. The woods were dark and gloomy, the trees bare of leaves, the branches clacked together in the wind like the bones of the dead Jensen feared the Sisters were calling forth. The chanting suddenly halted. Rather than sit in the single empty spot remaining in the circle of Sisters, as Jensen had expected, Sister Perdita stood behind her and spoke short, sharp words in the strange language. At points in the long sing-song speech, Sister Perdita stressed a word, Grushdeva, and cast her arm out over Jensen's head, flinging out dust. The dust ignited with a roaring whoosh that made Jensen jump each time she did it, the harsh light bathing the sisters briefly in the light of the rolling flame. As the fire ascended, the seven sisters spoke as if with one voice. Tu va schmischt, tu vas kmischt, grush deva du kalt mischt. Not only were those words she knew, but Jensen realized that the voice was speaking the words in her head along with the sisters. It was both frightening and comforting to have the voice back. The anxiety when the voice had gone, strangely silent, had been unbearable. Tu vas mischt. Tu vas kmischt, grush deva du kalt mischt. Jensen was lulled by the sound of the chanting, and as it went on, calmed, too. She thought about what it was that had brought her to this point, about the terror her life had been, from the time when she was six and she fled the people's palace with her mother, to all the times that Lord Rahl had come close and they'd run for their lives, to that awful rainy night where Lord Rahl's men were in her house. Jensen felt tears coursing down her cheeks as she thought about her mother there on the floor, dying. 
as she thought about Sebastian fighting valiantly, as she thought about her mother's last words and having to run and leave her mother there on the bloody floor. Jensen cried out with the terrible anguish of it. Tu vas misht, tu vas misht, grush deva du kalt misht. Jensen cried in racking sobs. She missed her mother. She was afraid for Sebastian. She felt so terribly alone in the world. She had seen so many people die. She wanted it to end. She wanted it to stop. Tu vas misht, tu vas misht, grush deva du kalt misht. When she looked up through her watery vision, she saw something dark sitting in the spot before her that had moments before been empty. Its eyes glowed like the candlelight. Jensen stared into those eyes as if staring into the voice itself. Tu vas misht, Jensen. Tu vas misht, Jensen. The voice before her and in her head said in a low growling voice, Open yourself to me, Jensen. Open yourself for me, Jensen. Jensen could not move in the glowing glare of those eyes. That was the voice. Only not in her head, it was the voice in front of her. Sister Perdita behind her cast out her dust again, and this time, when it ignited, it lit the person sitting there with the glowing eyes. It was her mother. Jensen, her mother cooed. Sarangi. What? Jensen whimpered in shock. Surrender. Tears flooded forth in an uncontrollable torrent. Mama, oh, Mama. Jensen started to rise, started to go to her mother, but Sister Perdita pressed down on her shoulders, keeping her in place. As the rolling flames lifted and evaporated, as the light faded, her mother vanished into the darkness, and before her was the thing with the glowing candlelight eyes. Grush deva du kalt misht, the voice growled. What? Jensen wept. Vengeance is through me, the voice growled in translation. Sorangi, Jensen, surrender and vengeance will be yours. Yes, Jensen wailed in inconsolable agony. Yes, I surrender to vengeance. The thing grinned like a door to the underworld opening. It rose up, a wavering shadow, leaning forward toward her. Moonlight glistened on knotted muscles as it stretched out, coming toward her, almost cat-like, smiling, showing those heart-stopping fangs. Jensen was beyond knowing what to do, except that she had had all she could take and wanted it to end. She could take none of it any longer. She wanted to kill Richard Rawl. She wanted vengeance. She wanted her mother back. The thing was right before her, shimmering power and form that was there but not, partly in this world and partly in another. Jensen saw then beyond the thing, beyond the ring of sisters and sparkling white sand and candles, huge shapes out in the shadows, things on four legs. There were hundreds of them, their eyes all glowing yellow in the darkness, breath steaming up from snarls. They looked like they could have come from another world, but were most definitely now wholly in this one. Jensen, the voice hovering close over her whispered. Jensen, it cooed. Jensen. It smiled a smile as dark as Emperor Jagang's eyes, as dark as a moonless night. What? she whispered through her tears. What are those things out there? Why, the hounds of vengeance, the voice whispered intimately. Embrace me, and I shall unleash them. Her eyes widened. What? Surrender to me, Jensen. Embrace me, and I shall unleash the hounds in your name. Jensen couldn't blink as she sank back away from the thing. She could hardly breathe. A low sound, a kind of purring rattle, came from the throat of the thing as it stretched over her, looking down into her eyes. She was trying to think of that little word, that important little word. It was somewhere in her mind, but as she stared up into those glowing eyes, she couldn't think of it. Her mind felt frozen. She wanted that word, but it wasn't there. Grush deva du kalt misht, 
the voice cooed in that throaty, echoing growl. Vengeance is through me. Vengeance, Jensen whispered numbly in answer. Open yourself to me. Open yourself for me. Surrender. Avenge your mother. The thing passed a long finger over her face, and she could feel where Richard Raw was, as if she could feel the bond that told others where he was. To the south. Distant to the south. She could find him now. Embrace me, the voice breathed, inches from her face. Jensen was flat on her back. The realization both surprised and alarmed her. She didn't recall lying back. She felt like she was watching someone else do these things. She realized that the thing that was the voice was kneeling between her open legs. Surrender your will, Jensen. Surrender your flesh, the voice cooed. And I will release the hounds for you. I will help you kill Richard Rall. The word was gone. Lost. Just like her. Lost. I... I... She stammered as tears ran from her wide eyes. Embrace me and vengeance will be yours. Richard Rall will be yours to kill. Embrace me. Surrender your flesh and with it your will. She was Jensen Rall. It was her life. No. The sisters in the circle wailed in sudden pain. They held their hands to their ears, crying in agony, howling like hounds. The glowing candlelight eyes peered down at her. The smile returned, this time vapor hissing from between wet fangs. Surrender, Jensen, the voice rumbled with such terrible command that Jensen thought it might crush her. Surrender your flesh. Surrender your will, and then you will have vengeance. You will have Richard Rall. No, she said, shrinking back as the thing stretched closer to her face. Her fingers dug into the dirt. No, I will surrender my flesh, my will, if that is the price, if that is what I must do to rid the world of life of the murdering bastard Richard Rall, but I will not do so until you give me that first. A bargain, the voice hissed. The glow in the eyes went red. You wish to bargain with me. That is my price. Release your hounds. Help me kill Richard Rall. When I have vengeance, then I will surrender. The thing grinned a nightmare grin. A long, thin tongue snaked out, licking her in terrible, intimate promise. From her naked crotch all the way up to between her breasts, it sent a violent shudder through her to her very soul. Bargain struck, Jensen Rall. Chapter 53 Friedrich wove his way between the fat clumps of grasses at the edge of the small lake, trying not to think about how hungry he was. With the way his stomach grumbled, he was not having much success. Fish might be nice for a change, but fish had to be cooked, and first he had to catch one. He gazed along the water's edge. Frog legs would be good, too. A meal of dried meat, though, would be quicker. He wished he had gotten a hard biscuit out of his pack the last time he'd stopped for a respite. At least if he had, he would have something to suck on. In some places, shorter grass bowed over to line the lake's edge like a green pelt. In other places, there were hushed stands of tall reeds. As the sun sank behind the low hills beyond the lake, it began to turn gloomy in among the imposing trees, contorted by great age on the other side of the path. The air was dead still, leaving the mirrored surface of the water gilded with the golden glow of the western sky. Friedrich paused to stand at ease, stretching his back as he peered into the shadows among the trees. He needed a brief break to rest his tired legs as he considered whether or not he should stop for the night to set up a shelter or at least get out a biscuit. He could see dark stretches of standing water in among trees draped with long strands of gauzy moss. The hilly countryside was easy enough traveling when the path stayed up out of the low places. Down in the depressions it tended to be swampy and hard going. He didn't like the swampy places. They brought back painful memories. 
Friedrich swished at a small cloud of gnats flitting around his face, then shifted the shoulder straps of his pack as he tried to decide what to do, make camp or push on. Even though he was tired and sore from an arduous day of traveling, he had grown stronger over the course of such a long journey and was now better able to stand the rigors of his new life, at least much more so than he had been at first. As he walked along, Friedrich often talked in his mind to Althea. He would describe to her all the sights he was seeing, the terrain, the vegetation, the sky, hoping that in the world beyond she was able to hear him and smiled her golden smile. With the day drawing to an end, he had to decide what to do. He didn't want to be traveling when it grew too dark. It was a new moon, so he knew that once the afterglow of dusk receded, the darkness would be nearly total. There were no clouds, so at least the starlight would stave off the kind of smothering total blackness he hated most, the kind where he couldn't even see up from down. That was the worst. That was when he was most lonely. Even with the stars out, it was difficult to travel unknown regions by starlight alone. In darkness, it was easy to wander off the path and end up getting lost. Getting lost would mean that in the morning he would likely have to backtrack to find a way through an impassable area or find the trail, and in the end it accomplished nothing but to waste time. It would be wise to set up camp. It was warm, so he wouldn't really need a fire, although for some reason he felt as if he wanted one. Still, with a fire he might attract notice. He had no real way to know who might be around, and a campfire could be spotted for miles. Best not to have a fire, as much comfort as it would provide, in exchange for the security. At least there would be stars overhead. He considered, too, the possibility that if he kept going, the trail might shortly lift out of the boggy lowlands and he would come across a better place for a campsite, a place not as likely to be rife with snakes. Snakes, seeking warmth, would slither up to be close to a person sleeping on the ground. He'd not like to wake to find a snake cuddled up to him under his blanket. Friedrich hiked his pack up higher on his back. There was still enough light to push on for a while. Before he could start out again, he heard a small sound. Even though it wasn't loud, the inexplicable nature of it made him turn and look back up the trail to the north, the direction from which he had come. He couldn't quite put the sound to anything that came to mind, to any frog or squirrel or bird. As he listened, it was again dead quiet. I'm getting too old for this sort of thing, he muttered to himself as he started out once more. The other reason nagging at him to keep going, the reason that was actually the most important, was that he hated to stop when he was this close. Of course, it could still be distant enough to require a walk of several days. It was hard for him to tell with any precision, but it was also possible that he was much closer. If that was the case, stopping for the night would be foolish. Time was of the essence. He could walk for a little longer, at least. There was still time to make camp, if he had to, before it was too dark. He supposed he could push on until he couldn't see the trail well enough to follow it and then make himself a place to sleep in the grass beside the lake. But Friedrich didn't really relish the notion of sleeping out in the open right beside a trail either, not when he was so deep into the old world, and not when he knew there could be night patrols about. He'd been seeing more of the orders patrolling troops in recent days. He'd avoided cities and towns, for the most part sticking as close as he could to a straight course down through the old world. Several times he'd had to change that course when the destination had changed. As he traveled, Friedrich had gone to great pains to avoid troops. Being near any of the order soldiers meant there was always the potential of being detained for questioning. While he wasn't as free of suspicion as a farmer in his own home might be, he knew that an older man traveling alone didn't look very threatening to big young soldiers and wasn't likely to raise suspicions. However, he also knew from bits of conversation he'd overheard when he had been in towns that the Imperial Order had no qualms about torturing people when the fancy struck them. Torture had the great advantage of always eliciting a confession of guilt, which proved the questioner's wise judgment in having suspicions in the first place, and if desired, could produce the names of more conspirators with wrong thoughts, as he had heard told. A cruel questioner never ran out of work or guilty people needing punishment. At a snapping sound, Friedrich turned around and stood still as a stump, listening, watching. The sky and lake were mirrored violet. 
Tree limbs stood out still and silent, hanging out over sections of the path like claws, waiting to snatch travelers when it became dark enough. The woods were probably full of creatures just coming out from a long day's sleep to hunt at night. Owls, voles, opossum, raccoons, and other creatures became more active as it got dark. He watched, waiting to see if he heard the sound again. Nothing moved in the hush of twilight. Friedrich turned back to the trail and hurried his steps. It must be some creature searching through the forest litter, looking for a grub. His breathing quickened with his increased effort. He tried to wet his mouth by working his tongue, but it wasn't really doing much good. Despite his thirst, he didn't want to stop to have a drink of water. He was just imagining things he knew. He was in a strange land by a strange wood, and it was getting dark. He wasn't usually so susceptible to being spooked by the little noises in the woods that frightened most people. He'd lived in the swamp with Althea a good long time, and he knew about truly terrifying beasts. He also knew a great deal about the variety of those creatures that were innocent enough, just going about their own lives. This was undoubtedly innocent. Still, he no longer felt tired or wanted to stop for the night. Friedrich turned to look over his shoulder as he hurried along the faintly lit trail. He had the uncanny feeling that there was something behind him, something watching him. The thought of being watched made the hair at the nape of his neck stand on end. He kept looking, but he saw nothing. It remained quiet behind him. He knew that either it was too quiet or else his imagination was too active. Breathing hard, his heart pounding, Friedrich quickened his pace. Maybe if he hurried, he would finally get there and not have to be all alone in the night out in the woods. He glanced back over his shoulder again. Eyes were watching him. It startled him so much that he tripped over his own feet and fell sprawling to the ground. He scrambled around to sit up and face back down the trail as he crabbed backward on his hands and feet. The skulking eyes were still there. He hadn't imagined it. Twin, glowing yellow eyes watching from back in the dark gloom of the woods. In the still hush, he heard a low growl as the beast stole out of the shadows into the somber light between the forest and the lake. It was huge, maybe twice the size of a wolf, with a massive chest and bull neck. It took careful steps, the head hovering low to the ground as it advanced, glowing eyes never leaving him. The thing was stalking. With a cry, Friedrich scrambled to his feet and took off running as fast as his legs would fly. His age mattered little when powered by such a fright. A quick glance over his shoulder revealed the beast bounding down the trail behind him, easily closing the distance. Worse yet, in that brief glance back, Friedrich saw more pairs of glowing yellow eyes emerging from the woods to join in the pursuit. They were coming out for the night's hunt. Friedrich was their prey. The howling beast hit his back with such force that it drove the wind from his lungs. He pitched face first to the ground, hitting with a grunt, sliding through the dirt. As he tried to scramble away, the powerful beast pounced on him. Raging with snarling, snapping teeth, it lunged, caught his backpack, tearing it open in a mad effort to get at his bone and muscle. Friedrich vividly envisioned being torn apart. He knew he was about to die. Chapter 54 Friedrich screamed in terror as he struggled frantically to escape. Right over his shoulder, the thing howled with vicious fury as snapping teeth tore through his backpack, trying to rip him apart. His backpack, stuffed full of his things, was now a bulwark between Friedrich and the huge teeth tearing at him. The weight of the savage beast held him down, and the clutching forelegs kept him from being able to wriggle away, much less get up and run. With desperate urgency, Friedrich forced his hand under himself, trying to reach his knife. His fingers caught the handle and pulled it free. Immediately, he struck out, slamming his blade into the beast. It hit hide-covered shoulder bone, doing little damage. He stabbed again, but failed to make contact. Fighting for all he was worth, he slashed as he rolled, missing the beast, trying to get away when it ducked his blade. Just as he was about to escape to the side, if only to spare himself momentarily, more of the beasts bounded into the fray. Friedrich screamed again, slashing with his knife, trying to protect his face with his other arm at the same time. 
he managed to get up on his hands and knees only to have another of the beasts pounce and knock him sprawling. Friedrich saw the book tumble out of the inner pocket he'd stitched into his pack. Their teeth had ripped open the sealed compartment. The beasts lunged for the book. The one that snatched it up in its jaws snarled and shook its head like a hound with a hare. Just as another of the howling creatures roared toward him, wet fangs stretching wide, the head abruptly spun crazily away. Hot blood splashed across the side of Friedrich's face and neck. It was totally unexpected and completely disorienting. In the water, a man yelled at him. Jump in the water. It was all Friedrich could do to roll and twist, trying to keep himself from the snapping, snarling beasts. He certainly had no intention of going into the water. He had no desire to be set upon by such ferocious animals in water. That was a favorite trick of beasts in the swamp. Get you in the water, then they had you. Going in the water was the last thing Friedrich wanted. The world seemed to go mad with steel flashing by his face, just over his head, up along the side of him, whistling through the air, slicing beasts apart with each mighty swing, defending him just before they were on him. Reeking, slippery innards spilled across the ground, slopped across his legs. The man above stepped over Friedrich, straddling him. His sword slashed and stabbed with swift, fluid grace that Friedrich found spellbinding. The stranger stood his ground over Friedrich, cutting through the creatures as they charged, seemingly dozens of them, all snarling and howling. Friedrich saw yet more of the wild beasts bound out of the woods. With frightening speed and terrifying determination, they leaped at the man standing over him, throwing themselves at him with wild abandon. Friedrich saw another swordsman to the side slice into the onslaught. He thought he saw a third person behind, but with all the furious activity, he wasn't sure how many rescuers there might be. The strident snarling, rising howls and roaring growls all so close were deafening. When one of the heavy beasts crashed sideways into him, Friedrich stabbed it, only to see that it was already headless. As the second person raced in close to join the fray, the man standing over Friedrich stepped to the side, reached down with one hand, snatched a fistful of his shirt, lifted him to his feet, and with a grunt, heaved him out into the lake. Friedrich had no time to get his balance and only an instant to gasp a breath before he hit the water. He plunged under, unable to tell up from down in the dark depths. Breaking the surface, gasping for air, splashing for the shore, Friedrich finally found footing on the muddy bottom and was just able to keep his head above the surface of the water. To his surprise, none of the beasts came in after him. Several raced to the shore, but stopped short, unwilling to enter the water despite how much they hungered to have him. When they saw he was out of reach, they returned to the attack and were killed as soon as they joined the others charging the big man. The beasts leaped at the three from all sides, the fierce battle raging on with frightening intensity. As fast as the animals attacked, they were dispatched decisively, beheaded, stabbed, or rent open with mighty swings of a sword. With sudden finality, the dark figure swung upward, lopping the head off a beast as it leaped through the air toward the second person. The night finally fell silent, but for the heavy breathing of the three people up on the trail. The three stepped out of the pile of unmoving carcasses to sit wearily on the bank, exhausted, heads hanging as they caught their breath. Are you all right? The first of the three, the one who had saved Friedrich's life, asked. His voice was still filled with the terrible rage of battle. His blood-slick sword, still in his hand, glinted in starlight. Friedrich, stunned and shivering, suddenly weak with relief, took several steps toward the shore, water sluicing off him until he was standing waist-deep in the lake before the man. Yes, thanks to you. Why'd you throw me in the water like that? The man raked his fingers back through thick hair. Because, he said, between deep breaths, pulled not just from exertion but driven by wrath, heart hounds won't go in water. It was the safest place for you. Friedrich swallowed as his gaze played over the dark heaps of hounds. I don't know how to thank you. You saved my life. Well, the man said, still catching his breath, I happen not to like heart hounds. They've scared the wits out of me on more than one occasion. Friedrich feared to ask where the man would have seen such fearsome creatures before. 
We were way back up the trail when we saw them come out after you, it was a woman's voice. Friedrich stared at the figure in the middle who had spoken as she caught her breath. He could just make out her long fall of hair. We were worried that we wouldn't reach you before the heart hounds had you, she added. But what are heart hounds? The three figures stared at him. The more important question, the first man said at last in a quiet, measured, but commanding voice, is why were heart hounds here at all? Do you have any idea why they might have been after you? No, sir. I've never seen such creatures before. It's been a long while since I've seen heart hounds, the man said, sounding troubled. Friedrich almost thought that he'd been going to say more about the hounds, but instead he asked, What's your name? Friedrich Gilder, sir, and you have my undying gratitude. All of you do. I haven't been that scared since... Well, since I don't know when. He looked to the three faces watching him, but it was too dark to clearly make out their features. The first man put an arm around the woman in the middle and in a whisper asked if she was all right. She answered with the kind of nod against his shoulder that Friedrich knew conveyed true concern and intimate familiarity. When his fingers reached past, touching the shoulder beyond her, the third figure nodded. These weren't at all likely to be Imperial Order soldiers. Still, there were always other risks in such a strange land. Friedrich took a chance. May I ask your name, sir? Richard. Friedrich took a cautious step closer, but for some reason, by the way the silent third person watched him, he feared to step up out of the water any closer to Richard and the woman. Richard swished his blade clean in the water, then stood. After wiping both sides dry on his leg, he slid the sword home into its scabbard at his hip. In the dim light, Friedrich could see that the lustrous silver and gold wrought scabbard was secured with a baldric over Richard's right shoulder. Friedrich was pretty sure that he remembered the look of that baldric and scabbard. Friedrich had carved for nearly his whole life and also recognized a certain effortless grace with a blade, no matter what kind of blade. Artful control was required to wield edged steel with mastery. When it was in Richard's hands, he truly seemed in his element. Friedrich well remembered the sword the man was wearing that day. He wondered if this could possibly be that same remarkable weapon. With a foot, Richard prodded at parts of heart hounds, searching. He bent and lifted a severed hound head. Friedrich saw then that the beast had something clenched in its teeth. Richard tugged at it, but it was impaled on the fangs. As he worked it out of the hound's mouth, off the fangs, Friedrich's eyes went wide when he realized that it was the book. The hound had torn it out of the backpack. Please, Friedrich lifted a hand, reaching. Is it, is it all right? Richard tossed the heavy head aside where it thumped down and rolled into the trees. He peered closely at the book in the dim light, his hand lowered, and he looked over at Friedrich standing in waist-deep water. I think you had better tell me who you are and why you're here, Richard said. The woman rose up at the dark tone in Richard's voice. Friedrich cleared his throat and swallowed back his worry. Like I said, I'm Friedrich Gilder. He took a terrible chance. I'm looking for a man related to a very old fellow I know named Nathan. Richard stood staring for a moment. Nathan? Big man, tall, long, white hair to his shoulders? Thinks a lot of himself? He sounded not just surprised, but suspicious as well. Born for mischief, Nathan? Friedrich smiled at the last part, and with relief. His bond had served him well. He bowed as best he could, standing in the water. Master Rall guide us. Master Rall teach us. Master Rall protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we are sheltered. In your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are yours. Lord Rall watched as Friedrich finally straightened and then extended a hand down. Come out of the water, Master Gilder, he said in a gentle voice. Friedrich was somewhat confounded to be offered a helping hand by Lord Rahl himself, and yet didn't know how he could refuse what could be judged an order. He took the hand and pulled himself up out of the water. Friedrich went to a knee, bowing forward. Lord Rahl, my life is yours. Thank you, Master Gilder. I'm honored by your gesture and value the sincerity, but your life is your own and belongs to no one else. That includes me. 
Friedrich stared up in wonder. He had never heard anyone say anything so remarkable, so unimaginable, least of all a Lord Rall. Please, sir, would you call me Friedrich? Lord Rall laughed. It was a sound as easy and pleasant as any Friedrich had ever heard. It made a smile well up through him, too. If you'll call me Richard. I'm sorry, Lord Rall, but I'm afraid that I just couldn't bring myself to do such a thing. I've spent my whole life with a Lord Rall, and I'm too old to change it now. Lord Rall hooked a thumb behind his wide belt. I understand, Friedrich, but we're deep in the old world. If you utter the words, Lord Rall, and anyone hears you, we're all likely to have a great deal of trouble on our hands. So I would greatly appreciate it if you would do your best to learn to call me Richard. I'll try, Lord Rall. Lord Rall held out an introductory hand. This is the mother confessor, Kalen, my wife. Friedrich went to a knee again, bowing his head. Mother confessor. He wasn't sure how to properly greet such a woman. Now, Friedrich, she said with as much of a scolding tone as Lord Rawls, but in a voice that he thought revealed a woman of rare grace, command, and heart, that title, too, will serve us ill here. It was as lovely a voice as Friedrich had ever heard, its lucid quality holding him spellbound. He had seen the woman once in the palace. The voice fit his memory of her perfectly. Friedrich nodded. Yes, ma'am. He thought he might be able to learn to call Lord Rall Richard, but he was almost positive that he would never be able to call this woman anything other than Mother Confessor. The familiar name, Kalin, seemed a privilege beyond him. Lord Rall gestured past the Mother Confessor. And this is our friend, Kara. Don't let her scare you. She'll try. Besides being a friend, first, she is a valued protector who remains always concerned for our safety above all else. He glanced over at her. Although lately she has been causing more trouble than help. Lord Rall, Kara growled. I told you that wasn't my fault. I had nothing to do with it. You're the one who touched it. Well, how was I supposed to know? I told you to leave it be, but you had to touch it. I couldn't very well just leave it, now could I? Friedrich didn't understand a word of the exchange. But even in the near darkness, he could see the mother confessor smile and pat Kara on the shoulder. It's all right, Kara, she whispered reassuringly. We'll figure something out, Kara, Lord Rall added in a sigh. We still have time. He turned suddenly solemn and switched his line of thought as swiftly as he changed direction with that sword of his. He waggled the book. The hounds were after this. Friedrich's eyebrows went up in astonishment. They were? Yes, you were just the treat for doing a good job. How do you know? Heart hounds would never attack a book. They would have fought to the death over your heart first, had they not been sent for another reason. So that's why they're called heart hounds, Friedrich said. That's one theory. The other is that with those big round ears, they can find their victim by the sound of their beating heart. Either way, I've never heard of a heart hound going for a book when a human heart was there for the taking. Friedrich gestured to the book. Lord, sorry, uh, Richard. Nathan sent me with this book. He thought it was very important. I guess he was right. Lord Rall turned back from staring at the hounds sprawled across the ground. If it had not been dark, Friedrich was sure he would have seen a frown, but he certainly could hear repressed anger in the man's voice. Nathan thinks a lot of things are important, usually prophecies. But Nathan was sure about this. He always is. He's helped me before, I don't deny that, Lord Rawl shook his head with determination. But from the beginning, prophecy has been the cause of more trouble for us than I care to think about. Heart hounds mean we suddenly have immediate, deadly danger on our hands. I don't need Nathan's prophecies adding to my problems. I know some people think prophecy is a gift, but I regard it as a curse best avoided. I understand, Friedrich said with a wistful smile. My wife was a sorceress. Her gift was prophecy. She sometimes called it her curse. His smile faltered. I sometimes held her as she wept over some foretelling she saw, but could not change. Lord Rall watched him in the awkward silence. She's passed away then. Friedrich could only nod as he sagged under the pain of the memories. I'm sorry, Friedrich, Lord Rall said in a quiet voice. So am I, the mother confessor whispered in sad, sincere sympathy. She turned to her husband, 
clasping his upper arm. Richard, I know we don't have time for Nathan's prophecies, but we can hardly ignore what hearthounds mean. Distress sounded heavily in Lord Rawl's sigh. I know. What are we going to do? Friedrich saw him shake his head in the dim light. We'll have to hope they can handle it for now. This is more urgent. We'll need to find Nietzsche, and fast. Let's just hope she has some ideas. The mother confessor seemed to accept what he'd said as sensible. Even Kara was nodding silent agreement. I'll tell you what, Friedrich, the mother confessor said in a voice steady with metal. We were about to set up camp for the night. With the heart hounds loose, you had better stay with us until we meet up with some of our friends in a day or two and have better protection. At camp, you can tell us what this is all about. I'll listen to what Nathan wants, Lord Rawl said, but that's all I can promise. Nathan is a wizard. He's going to have to solve his own problems. We have enough of our own. Let's make camp first, somewhere safe. I'll at least take a look at this book, if it's still readable. You can tell me why Nathan thinks it's so important. Just spare me the prophecies. No prophecies, Lord Rawl. In fact, the lack of prophecy is the real problem. Lord Rawl gestured around at the carcasses. This is the immediate problem. We'd better find a spot down there in the swamp surrounded by water if we want to live to see morning. There will be more where these came from. Friedrich peered nervously around in the darkness. Where do they come from? The underworld, Lord Rawl said. Friedrich's jaw dropped. The underworld? But how is such a thing possible? Only one way, Lord Rawl said in a low voice filled with terrible knowledge. Hard hounds are, in a way, the guardians of the underworld, the keeper's hounds. They can only be here because the veil between life and death has been breached. Chapter 55 The four of them started down the path, heading toward the dark expanse of low-lying forest, as Friedrich contemplated the staggering significance of the veil between the world of life and the world of the dead being breached. The latter part of Althea's life revolved around the grace she used in her tellings, so he certainly knew about the veil between worlds. Over the years, Althea had often spoken to him about it. In particular, preceding her death, she had told him much of what she had come to believe about the interaction of those worlds. Lord Rahl, Friedrich said, I think what you said about the veil between the world of the living and the dead being torn might be tied in with why Nathan thought it was so vital that I reach you with this book. He doesn't want you to help him. That's not why he sent me with this book. He meant this to help you. Lord Rawl snorted a laugh. Right, that's the way he always puts it, that he only wants to help you. But I think this is about your sister. Everyone froze in their tracks. Lord Rawl and the Mother Confessor spun around, hovering close to him. Even in the darkness, Friedrich could see how wide their eyes were open. I have a sister, Lord Rawl whispered. Yes, Lord Rawl, Friedrich said, taken by surprise that he didn't know. Well, a half-sister, actually. She, too, is the offspring of Dark and Rawl. Lord Rawl seized him by the upper arms. I have a sister? Do you know anything about her? Yes, Lord Rawl, a little anyway. I've met her. Met her? Friedrich, that's wonderful. What's she like? How old is she? Not many years younger than you, Lord Rawl. Early twenties, I'd say. Is she smart? He asked with a grin. Too smart for her own good, I'm afraid. Lord Rawl laughed in delight. I can't believe it. Kaylin, isn't that wonderful? I have a sister. It doesn't sound wonderful to me, Kara growled before the mother confessor could answer. It doesn't sound wonderful at all. Kara... How can you say that? the mother confessor asked. Kara leaned toward them. Need I remind you both of the trouble we had when Lord Rawl's half-brother Drethen showed up? No, Lord Rawl said, clearly troubled by the mention. Everyone fell silent. What happened? Friedrich finally dared to ask. He gasped when Kara snatched him by the collar and jerked him close to her hot glare. That bastard son of Dark and Rawl nearly killed the Mother Confessor and Lord Rawl. He nearly killed me. He did kill a lot of other people. He nearly got everyone killed. I hope the Keeper of the Dead put Dreth and Rawl in a cold, dark hole for all of eternity. If you only knew what he did to the Mother Confessor... That's enough, Kara, the Mother Confessor said in quiet command 
as she put a hand on the woman's arm, gently urging her to release Friedrich's collar. Kara complied, but in the heat of anger, only with great reluctance. Friedrich could clearly see why this woman was a guard to the Lord Rall and the Mother Confessor. Even though he could not see her eyes, he could feel them, like a hawk's, locked on him even in the dark. This was a woman whose penetrating judgment could weigh a man's soul and decide his fate. This was a woman not only with the authority, but with the ability to act on what she decided was necessary. Friedrich knew because he had seen women like this often in the people's palace. When her hand came out from under her cloak to snatch him by the collar, he'd seen her Aegeel dangling on a chain from her wrist. This was a moored Sith. I'm sorry about your half-brother, Friedrich said, but I don't think Jensen means you harm. Jensen, he whispered, testing his first encounter with the name of someone he never knew existed. As a matter of fact, Jensen is terrified of you, Lord Rao. Terrified of me? Why would she be afraid of me? She thinks you're after her. Lord Rawl stared incredulously. After her? How can I be after her? I've been stuck down here in the old world. She thinks you want to kill her, that you send men to hunt her down. He was stunned to silence for a moment, as if each new thing he was hearing was even more incredible than the last. But I don't even know her. Why would I want to kill her? Because she is ungifted. Lord Rawl stepped back, trying to understand what Friedrich was telling him. What difference does that make? Lots of people are ungifted. Friedrich pointed to the book in Lord Rawl's hand. I think Nathan sent that book to explain it. Prophecy won't help explain anything. No, Lord Rawl, I don't think this has to do with prophecy so much as with free will. You see, I know some about prophecy from my wife. Nathan explained how prophecy needs free will, and that's why you react so strongly against prophecy, because you are a man who brings free will to balance the magic of prophecy. He said that prophecy had not proclaimed it to be me who was to bring this book to you, but that I had to bring it of my own free will. Lord Rawl stared at the book in the darkness. His tone softened. Nathan can be trouble at times, but I know he's a friend who has helped me before. His help can sometimes cause me considerable trouble, but even if I don't always agree with the things he chooses to do, I know he chooses to do them for good reason. I loved a sorceress for most of my life, Lord Rao. I know how complex such things as this can be. I would not have come all this way if I didn't believe Nathan in this. Lord Rawl appraised him for a moment. Did Nathan say what was in this book? He told me the book is from the time of a great war thousands of years ago. He said he discovered it in the people's palace after a frantic search among the thousands of tomes there, and that as soon as he'd located it, he brought it to me to ask that I take it to you. He said time was so urgently short that he dare not take any more to translate the book. Because of that, he didn't know what was in it. Lord Rawl looked down at the book with considerably more interest. Well, I don't know how much good it's going to be able to do us, the hounds did a lot of damage to it. I'm beginning to fear why. Richard, do you know at least what it says on the cover? The mother confessor asked. I only saw it in the light long enough to see that it was in High Daharan. I didn't try to translate it. It says something about creation. You're right, Lord Rawl. Nathan told me the title. Friedrich tapped the book. It says there on the cover in gilded letters, The Pillars of Creation. Great, Lord Raw muttered, seemingly an unhappy recognition of the title. Well, let's get to a safe place and set up camp. I don't want the heart hounds to catch us out in the open in the dark. We'll make a small fire, and maybe I can see if the book will tell us anything useful. You know about the pillars of creation, then? Friedrich asked, following after the three of them as they started off down the trail. Yes, Lord Raw said back over his shoulder in a troubled tone. I've heard of them. Nathan came from the old world, so I guess he would know about them, too. Friedrich scratched his jaw in confusion as they crested a small rise in the trail. What do the pillars of creation have to do with the old world? The pillars of creation are in the center of a forsaken wasteland, Lord Rawl pointed ahead to the south. It's not all that far from here, off that way. We went past there not long ago. We had to cross the fringes of the place, 
some very unpleasant people were after us. Their bloody bones are drying in the wasteland, Kara said with obvious pleasure. Unfortunately, Lord Rawl said, it cost us our horses, too. That's why we're on foot. At least we escaped with our lives. Wasteland. But, Lord Rawl, the pillars of creation are also what my wife called... Friedrich halted when something beside the path caught his eye. Even in the dim light, the hauntingly familiar dark shape silhouetted against the light color of the dusty trail drew him up short. He squatted down to touch it. To his surprise, it felt like what he thought. When he picked it up, he was sure of it. It had the same crooked opening for the drawstring, the same notch in the supple leather where he had once accidentally nicked it with a sharp gouge when he had been in a hurry. What's the matter? Lord Rawl asked in a suspicious voice as he scanned the near-dark landscape. Why did you stop? What did you find? The mother confessor asked. I didn't see anything there when I walked past. Neither did I, Lord Rawl said. Friedrich swallowed as he placed the leather pouch in the palm of his hand. It felt like there were coins inside, and by the weight, it felt like they were gold. This is mine, Friedrich whispered in stunned amazement. How could it possibly be here? He couldn't claim the gold was his, though it certainly could be, but he'd handled the leather pouch nearly every day for decades. He used it to hold one of his tools, a small gouge he used often. What's it doing here? Kara asked as her gaze swept the surrounding countryside. Her Aegeal was gripped tightly in her fist. Friedrich stood, still staring at his tool pouch. It was stolen by the man who I believe caused the death of my wife. Chapter 56 Well, wasn't that just something? Oba could hardly believe that he had dropped his money purse. He was always so careful. He huffed in exasperation. If it wasn't one thing, it was another. Either it was a scheming little cut purse or some thieving woman always after his money... Was that all that the small-minded little people cared about? Money? After all his troubles, all the envious, covetous, conniving people trying to get at his hard-earned fortune, Oba had learned that a man of his standing had to always be careful. He could hardly believe that this time he had done it to himself. He hurriedly checked his pockets, inside his shirt, down in his trousers. All his pouches full of his considerable wealth were there, right where they belonged. He supposed that the one out on the path might not be his, but what were the odds that someone else would drop a purse right there? When he checked the top of his boots, he found that one of his money purses was missing. Fuming, Oba checked the leather thong he always kept tied around his ankle and found it had come untied. Someone had untied his money purse. He peered out through the trees, watching the touching scene. His brother, Richard, and his precious wife turned to the man who had found the purse, Oba's purse, full of his money. It was stolen by the man who I believe caused the death of my wife, Oba heard the man exclaim. Oba's jaw dropped. It was the husband of the swamp witch, the obnoxious, selfish sorceress who wouldn't answer Oba's questions. Oba knew better than to think that this could all be some comical coincidence. He just flat knew better. Don't touch it, Richard Rawl and the mother confessor yelled at the same time. Run, the other woman yelled. Oba watched them bolt like frightened deer. He realized that the voice was up to something. He knew that the voice used what belonged to people to reach out to them. Oba looked to each side to the glowing yellow eyes watching with him and grinned. The very air shook as if the ground right there where the money purse hit had been struck by lightning. The hounds whined and backed away. Oba plugged each ear with a finger and squinted as he watched the violet concussion spread outward in a circle like the rings in a pond when he threw in a dead animal. In a brutal instant, quicker than thought, the people were flattened as the ring of violet light raced outward faster than his eye could follow. Oba's hair was blown back as the undulating circle swept past him. In its wake, the ground was left covered with a still cottony bed of eerie violet smoke. Oba's suspicions had been proven right. The voice was planning something grand. He wondered with delight what it could be. The scene had gone still, 
But Oba watched for a time to be sure the four people wouldn't get up. Only after he was confident that it was safe did he finally rise up from his secret watching place, the place where the voice had told him to wait. The voice urged him on now. The hound stayed well behind, watching as Oba hurried across the smoke-covered ground. It was the strangest smoke he had ever seen, a softly glowing bluish violet. But most odd of all, it didn't swirl as Oba ran through it. His legs passed through the still vapor without causing it to stir, as if it were in another world altogether, and he wasn't there with it, but just walking in the same place in this world. The four lay sprawled on the ground right where they had fallen. Oba cautiously leaned closer while trying to stay at a safe distance and found them all breathing, if slowly. Their eyes weren't closed. He wondered if they could see him. When he waved his arms, none of the four reacted. Oba bent over Richard Rawl, peering into his still face. He waved a hand low, right before his brother's unblinking eyes. There was no response. It was hard to see in the starlight, but Oba was sure he could make out in those eyes a bit of the fascinating family resemblance. It was a spooky feeling seeing a man who had a trace of similarity in his looks. Oba looked more like his mother, though. That would be just like her to want him to look more like her than his father. The woman was completely self-centered. She had tried to deny him his rightful place at every turn, even in his looks. The selfish bitch. But Richard was the man cheating Oba from his rightful place now, the place their father would have wanted Oba to have. After all, Oba and Dark and Rawl shared special qualities that Oba was sure his brother didn't have. A check showed that the old husband of the swamp witch was breathing too. Oba recovered his money purse from nearby and shook it over the man's staring eyes, but he too showed no response. Oba tied the purse back around his ankle now that the voice was finished with it. Oba wasn't thrilled about the voice using his money for such tricks, but with all the voice had done for him, making him invincible and all, he guessed he couldn't begrudge a favor now and again, as long as it didn't become a habit. The woman with them had a single long braid lying out across the grassy ground. She wore one of those strange rods on a chain around her wrist. He realized that she was a moored Sith. He squeezed her breasts. She didn't react. He grinned as he lingered at doing it again. With her so willing and all, he considered what else he might do. The idea was startlingly arousing. Oba realized then there was someone handy who was even better than a moored Sith. He peered over at her. His brother's wife, the woman they called the Mother Confessor, was lying there close by for the taking. What better justice than to have her? Oba crawled over to her, his grin fading with awed reverence when he saw how beautiful she was. She lay on her back, one arm thrown out to the side, her fingers open and slack, as if pointing the way south. Her other arm lay casually across her stomach. Her eyes, too, stared up at nothing. Oba carefully reached out and ran the back of a finger down her cheek. It was as soft as the silken petal of a rose. He pushed a long strand of hair back from her face to better see her features. Her lips were slightly parted. Oba bent over her, putting his lips close to hers, running his hand up her body, feeling her luscious form. His hand glided up the mound of her breast. He fondled it gently in his big hand, just to show her that he could be gentle. He reached over and squeezed her other breast, but still she refused to acknowledge how excited she was by his gentle, tantalizing touch. Quick as a fox, Oba blew in her parted mouth. She didn't react at all. He suspected that she was playing a game with him, teasing him, the haughty bitch. She was going nowhere now. She could not run now. The voice had apparently given him a gift. Oba threw his head back and laughed at the sky. As the hounds far back in the shadows watched, he howled his delight at the stars. Smiling, Oba bent back over Lord Rawl's wife, staring into her eyes. She was probably by now bored with her Lord Rawl husband and was ready for an adventuresome romp. The more Oba thought about it, the more he realized that this woman should be his. She belonged to the Lord Rawl. By all rights, Oba should keep her as his wife when he became the new Lord Rawl. And he would be the Lord Rawl. The voice had told him that such things were within his reach. 
Oba gazed at the sweep of her features, the curve of her body. He wanted his woman. He'd been doing favors for the voice and hadn't had time to be with a woman for ages. The voice had been prodding him ever onward at a breakneck pace. It was about time Oba had the pleasure of a woman. His hand roamed lightly over the mother confessor's body as he contemplated the satisfaction to come. But he didn't like the others watching him. They all refused to close their eyes and give him and the lady some privacy. Busybodies, all of them. Oba grinned. He supposed it might be a thrill to have her husband watch his wife's new master. The grin faded. What business was it of Richard's if she wanted a new man, a better man? Oba bent over his brother and pushed his eyelids closed. He did the same for the old man. He paused, deciding to let the other woman watch. It would undoubtedly arouse her to see Oba in action. Such arousal was a small favor, but Oba was inclined to do such favors for attractive women. Trembling with anticipation, knowing he could grant her the thrill he knew she craved, Oba bent to rip open the mother confessor's clothes. Before his fingers could touch her, a violent flash of violet light threw him back. Oba sat up, stunned, confused, pressing his hands to the nerve-shredding agony shrieking through his head. The voice was crushing his mind with punishing pain. Oba shoved at the ground with his feet, backing away from the mother confessor, and at last the pain eased. He sagged, panting with exhaustion after the brief bout. He felt downhearted that the voice would punish him so, dejected that the voice would be so cruel as to deny him so simple a pleasure, and after all the good things he had done. The voice changed then, cooing to him, whispering about the important calling it had for him, important works that only Oba was qualified to do. Through his melancholy, Oba listened. Oba was important, or the voice would not rely on him. Who else but Oba could accomplish such things as the voice asked of him? Who else could the voice depend on to set things right? Now in the silence of the still night, the voice made clear what it was Oba was to do. If he did as he was asked, then there would be rewards. Oba grinned at the pledges. First, he had to do the favor. Then, the mother confessor would be his. That wasn't so hard. Once she was his, he could do with her whatever he wanted, with the voice's blessing, and no one would interfere pictures of it, along with the smells, the feel, the cries of her pleasure, came into his mind, and he nearly fainted with the promise of such rapture. Oba could wait for an encounter such as this would be. He glanced over at the moored Sith. She could provide him some entertainment in the meantime. A man such as he, a man of action, great intellect, and heavy responsibilities, had to have a release of his pent-up tensions. Such diversions were a necessary outlet for a man of Oba's importance. He bent over the moored Sith, grinning into her open eyes. She was to be honored to be the first to have him. The mother confessor would have to wait her turn. He reached out to pull off her clothes. Oba's head suddenly flared with howling, blinding agony. He pressed his hands to his ears until it stopped. After he agreed. The voice was right. Of course it was. He could see that now. Only when Richard Rahl was dead could Oba take his rightful place. That made sense. It would be best to do things right. In fact, it would be wrong to bring pleasure to these women before he had done what needed doing. What had he been thinking? They didn't deserve him yet. They should first see him as the important man he was shortly to become, and then they would have to beg to have him. They didn't deserve him until they begged. He had to be quick. The voice said they would wake soon, that Lord Rahl would soon figure out how to break the spell of sleep. Oba pulled his knife and crawled to his brother. Lord Rahl was still staring dumbly at the stars. Who's the big oaf now? he asked his brother. Lord Rahl had no answer. Oba put the knife to Richard's throat, but the voice warned him back and filled his mind instead with what he must do. He had to do it right. He had to hurry. There was no time for such common retribution. There were much better ways to do such things, ways that would punish the man for all the years he had kept Oba from his rightful place. Yes, that was what Richard Rawl needed, proper punishment. Oba put his knife away and ran back over the nearby hill as fast as his legs would carry him. 
When he returned with his horse, the four were still lying there in the blue fog, staring up at the stars. Oba did as the voice asked and scooped up the mother confessor in his arms. She had now been promised to him. He would have her when the voice was done borrowing her. Oba could wait. The voice had promised him delights that Oba would never have dreamed up on his own. This was turning out to be a very beneficial partnership. For the paltry work involved and the small delay, Oba would have everything that rightfully belonged to him. The rule of Dahara and the woman who would be his queen. Queen. Oba puzzled at that as he heaved her body over the back of the saddle. Queen. If she was a queen, then he would have to be a king. He supposed that would be better than Lord Rahl. King Oba Rahl. Yes, that made better sense. He worked quickly to lash her down. Page 515. Before he mounted up, Oba peered down at his brother. He couldn't kill him, not yet. The voice had plans. If Oba was anything he had always been accommodating, he would oblige the voice. He put a foot in the stirrup. The voice tickled at him. He turned back, looking. He wondered. He cautiously returned to Richard's side. Carefully, Oba reached out and experimentally touched the sword. The voice murmured indulgently. A king should have a proper sword. Oba grinned. He deserved a small reward for all his hard work. He pulled the baldric off over Richard Rawls' head. He lifted the scabbard close, inspecting his gleaming new sword. The wire-wound hilt had a word woven into each side. Truth. Well, wasn't that just something? He lifted the baldric over his head and placed the scabbard at his hip. He patted his new wife's bottom before he mounted up. From the saddle, Oba grinned out at the night. He circled his horse around until the voice pointed him in the right direction. Hurry, hurry, before Lord Ra woke. Hurry, hurry, before he could be caught. Hurry, hurry, away with his new bride. He thumped his heels to the horse's ribs and off they charged. The hounds bounded out of the woods, a king's faithful escort. Chapter 57 Standing outside the squat buildings made of sun-dried bricks, Jensen idly surveyed the barren landscape broiling under a brutally blue sky. The rocks, the seemingly endless expanse of flat hardpan to her right, and the rugged range of mountains plummeting into the shimmering valley in the distance to her left, were all stained with variations of the same ruddy gray color as the sparse collection of square structures huddled nearby. The bone-dry air was so hot that it reminded her of nothing so much as bending over a bonfire and trying to breathe. Blistering heat radiated from the rocks and buildings around her and rose from the ground beneath her feet as if there were a blast furnace below. Using bare hands to touch anything baking under the ruthless sun was a painful experience. Even the hilt of her knife, shaded by her body, was so warm that it felt feverish. Jensen leaned a hip wearily against a low wall, nearly numb from the long and difficult journey. She patted Rusty's neck and then stroked an ear when the horse neighed gently and put her head close. At least Jensen was nearly at her journey's end. She felt as if she had lost sight of how it had all begun that day so long ago when she had found the dead soldier at the bottom of the ravine and Sebastian had happened by. What a long and tortured journey fate would deal her, she could never have guessed that day. She hardly knew herself anymore. Back then, she could never have guessed how much her life would change, or how much she would change. Sebastian, pulling Pete behind, reached out and gripped her arm. You all right, Jen? Pete nudged Rusty's flanks, as if to ask the same question of the mare. Yes, Jensen said. She smiled for him and then gestured to the knot of black-robed men in the doorway of a nearby building. Any luck? He's asking the others, Sebastian sighed in annoyance. They're a strange people. Despite being part of the old world and a part of the domain of the Imperial Order, the traders who traveled the vast deserted land, sometimes using the desolate trading outpost where Sebastian had found them, were an independent lot. Apparently, there were not enough of them to worry about, so the order didn't bother. 
Sebastian leaned against the wall beside her as he gazed out at the silent wasteland. He was weary, too, from the long journey back to his homeland of the old world, but at least he was well now, just as Sister Perdita had promised. The journey, though, had been nothing like what Jensen had thought it would be. She had imagined that she and Sebastian would be off on their own again, as they had been before traveling to the army of the Imperial Order. But behind them stretched a column of Imperial Order soldiers a thousand strong. A small escort, Sebastian had called them. She had told him that she wanted to go alone, but he said that there were more important considerations. With a thumbnail, Jensen idly picked at the leather reins while watching the figures in black. The men are afraid of all the soldiers, she told Sebastian. That's why they don't want to talk to us. What makes you think so? I can just tell by the way they keep peeking out. They're trying to decide if telling us anything will somehow get them in trouble with all the soldiers. She understood the way the small band of traders felt, to be under the scrutiny of so many brutish men sitting up on their big cavalry horses how it felt to be watched by such grim soldiers layered with leather and chainmail armor and bristling with weapons. The black-robed men with their pack mules were traitors, not soldiers, nor were they used to dealing with soldiers. They feared for their safety, feared that if they said something wrong, these warriors might decide to slaughter them out here in this wasteland. At the same time, while vastly outnumbered, the traitors seemed reluctant to be cowed, lest they set a precedent for how they were treated thereafter. They were debating now, trying to figure out the balance where their safety lay. Sebastian pushed away from the wall. Maybe you're right. I'll go in and talk to them alone, in their building, instead of out here under the eyes of the army. I'll go with you, she said. What is it? What do you think? Sister Perdita asked Sebastian as she marched up from behind. With a casual flip of his hand, Sebastian dismissed her concern. I think they just want to bargain. They're traitors. That's what they do, bargain. It might be counterproductive to try to force them. I will go in and change their minds, the sister said with dark intent. No, Sebastian said. Now is not the time to complicate a simple matter. We can always apply more pressure if we need to. Just let Jensen and me go in and talk to them first. Jensen walked away from a scowling sister Perdita, sticking close to Sebastian's side, pulling Rusty along behind. The other thing about the journey that had been unexpected, in addition to the escort of the thousand troops, had been that Sister Perdita had decided to come along. She said that it was necessary, in case Jensen needed any more help in getting close to Lord Rahl. Jensen just wanted to plunge her knife into that murderous bastard son of Dark and Rahl and be done with it all. She had long since given up any hope of it freeing her to have her own life. After that night in the woods with Sister Perdita and the seven other sisters, everything had changed. Jensen had made a bargain that she knew would mean she would have no life after she finally killed Richard Rahl. But at least everyone else would have their lives back. The world would at last be free of her half-brother and his evil rule. And she would have vengeance. Her mother, who had been denied even a proper burial, could at last rest in peace knowing that her murderer had finally been visited with justice. That was all Jensen could do for her mother. Jensen and Sebastian led Rusty and Pete to where the sister's horse was waiting in a small side paddock. Rusty and Pete welcomed the shade and the water trough. After closing the small rickety gate to the paddock, Jensen followed Sebastian into the shadow of the doorway of the squat building. The jabbering voices of the men echoing inside the single room fell silent. All the men were swathed in the traditional black robes of the nomadic traders who lived in this part of the world. Leave us then, the lead man said, waving his fellows out at seeing Sebastian and Jensen enter. The men, their eyes peering out at her from gaps in the black cloth they were pulling back up across their mouths and noses, nodded as they filed by. By their crinkled, exposed eyes, the men seemed to be smiling congenially at her from beneath the masks, but she couldn't be sure. Just in case, and considering what was at stake, she smiled back as she returned a bow of her head. The stagnant air inside the room was sweltering, but at least the shade was a relief. The one man remaining inside hadn't pulled the loose wraps of black cloth back up, so they sagged around his neck away from his smiling, weathered, leathery face. Please, he said to Jensen. Come in, you look fiery. Fiery, she asked. Hot, he said. 
You are not dressed for this place. He shuffled over to the rough plank shelves at the side and returned with one of the black bundles stored there. Please to wear this. He lifted it toward her several times, urging her to take it. It will make you better. It will cover you from the sun and hold in your sweat so you don't dry like rock. Jensen again bowed her head toward the small wiry man and smiled her appreciation. Thank you. Well, Sebastian asked when the man turned away from Jensen. Sebastian wearily pulled his pack off his back. Any luck finding out anything from those other men? The black-robed figure hesitated, clearing his throat. Well, they say that maybe... Sebastian impatiently rolled his eyes when he caught the man's veiled meaning and then fished around in his pocket until he came up with a silver coin. Please accept this gesture of my appreciation for the efforts of your men. The man took it respectfully, but it was clear the silver coin was not the price he was hoping for. He seemed hesitant, though, to say that he found the amount inadequate. Jensen couldn't believe that Sebastian was quibbling about money at a time like this. She pulled a heavy gold coin from her pocket, and without bothering to ask Sebastian if it was all right, simply flipped it to the man. The man caught the gold in midair, then opened his fist just enough for a peek of confirmation. He grinned his appreciation at her. Sebastian shot her a look of displeasure. It was Lord Rawls' blood money, the money he had given the men sent to kill her and her mother. She could think of no better use for it. I don't need it, she said before he could lecture her. Besides, aren't you the one who said it was your way to use what was close to the enemy to get back at him? Sebastian withheld any comment and turned to the man. What about it? Late yesterday, the man said, finally more forthcoming. Some of our men spotted two people coming down into the pillars of creation. He went to a small, uncovered window beside shelves, stocked with simple supplies along with more of the black outfits. He pointed. Down that way. There is a trail of sorts. Did your men talk to them? Jensen asked, stepping forward impatiently. Do your men know who it was? The man looked from her to Sebastian, hesitating, apparently not comfortable answering such direct questions from a woman, even if she had been the one who had paid his price. Sebastian gave her a look that said she should let him handle it. Jensen stepped back toward the doorway, peering out, acting disinterested, so that Sebastian could get the answers they needed. Jensen's heart hammered as she pictured in her mind stabbing Lord Rawl. The shadow of the awful price of luring her brother to this place where she was to kill him loomed over the scene in her mind of the act itself. Sebastian wiped sweat from his brow and tossed his heavy pack to the side of the floor. The pack hit with a hard clank and fell over. Some of the things spilled out. Annoyed, he made to pick it up, but Jensen intercepted him. I'll tend to this, she whispered, waving him back to the questioning of the small fellow in black. Sebastian leaned against the heavy, ancient-looking plank table and folded his arms. So, did your men have a chance to talk to these two people? No, sir. The men were not close enough, but stood at the rim and watched the horse pass below. Jensen retrieved a cake of lye soap and replaced it in the pack. She folded the razor and put it back in, along with an extra water skin that had tumbled out. She picked up small items, a flint, strips of dried meat wrapped in cloth and a whetstone. A tin she had never seen before had rolled out of the pack and under a low shelf. What did these two people on horseback look like then, Sebastian was asking, as he tapped a finger on the table. As she reached under the shelf, Jensen listened carefully, waiting to hear if this might be Richard Rawl. She couldn't really imagine who else it could be. She didn't believe such a thing could be coincidence. It was a man and a woman but they came on only one horse. Jensen thought that was strange, that both would be riding one horse. It sounded likely that it was what she expected, Lord Rawl and his wife, the mother confessor, but it was odd that they were on one horse. Something could have happened to the other horse. In this dangerous land, such a thing wasn't hard to imagine. The woman, she... The man made a face, uncomfortable with what he had to say. She was not upright, but lying flat, he gestured, as if draping something over the horse. Across the back, she was tied up with rope. As Jensen pulled the tin out in a rush of surprise, 
The lid caught a jagged edge of the wooden shelf and popped off. The contents spilled out across the floor in front of her. What did the man look like? Sebastian asked. A short piece of wood wound with twine and fastened down with fishing hooks had fallen out of the top of the tin. Jensen stared down at a dark pile of dried mountain fever roses that had spilled out after the twine. They looked like dozens of little graces. The man was big and young. He had a very grand sword, my men say. Its shining scabbard held on with a baldric across his shoulder. That sounds like Richard Rahl, Sister Perdita said from the doorway, startling Jensen. Other men use a baldric for their sword, Sebastian said. While she couldn't fathom a reason for him to have his wife tied across his horse, at the heady thought of Richard Rahl being spotted, Jensen hurriedly scooped up the dried mountain fever roses in her trembling fingers and stuffed them back in the tin, followed by the twine. She replaced the lid and quickly shoved the tin back into the pack along with the few remaining items that had fallen out. She checked her knife in its sheath at her belt as she hastily stood next to Sebastian, waiting to hear what else the wiry man in black might have to say. Sister Perdita had stepped outside and was wrapping herself in the protective black clothes. Come on, the sister called. We have to get down there. Jensen wanted to follow after her, but Sebastian was still questioning the man. She didn't want to leave Sebastian and go alone with Sister Perdita, but the woman was already heading off in the direction of the trail the man had pointed out. From outside, on the other side of the buildings, came the sound of the traders jabbering excitedly. Jensen peered around the side of the building and saw them pointing out across the flat-baked ground. What is it? Sebastian asked as he followed the man out the door. Someone approaches, the man said. Who could it be? Jensen whispered to Sebastian as he came up beside her. I don't know. Could just be another trader arriving at the post. The wiry little man, having answered the questions, bowed and wanted to depart to be with his men where they huddled together in the shade beside another building. Sebastian made him wait as he went back in and pulled a black bundle off the shelf. We best catch up with Sister Perdita, he said, as he watched the woman vanish over the rim of the trail down into the wavering landscape of the Pillars of Creation. She'll protect you from Richard Rawls' magic and help you do what you need to do. Jensen wanted to say that she didn't need Sister Perdita's protection, that Lord Rawls' magic couldn't hurt her, but it was not the time to go into the whole subject with him, to explain the whole thing to him. Somehow it never seemed the time. It didn't really matter, anyway, what Sebastian believed about how she could get close to Richard Rawl. It only mattered that she did. Together, the two of them stood in the sweltering sun, watching the tiny speck racing across the endless flat landscape. In the withering heat, the distant ground undulated like the rippling surface of a faraway lake. A thin plume of dust rose behind the lone rider. Their escort of a thousand men restlessly checked their weapons. Is it one of your men? Sebastian asked the wiry leader of the black-robed figures. The ground here plays tricks with your eyes, he said. He is still far off. The heat only makes him look closer. It will be some time before the rider reaches us, and we can tell who it is. He smiled at Jensen, gesturing encouragement. Put the clothing on and you will be covered from the sun. Rather than argue, Jensen threw the gauzy cape-like garment around her shoulders. She wrapped the long scarf over and around her head, as she had seen the men doing, pulling it across her nose and mouth and then tucking the tail under the side. She was immediately surprised at how the black cloth cut the hot glare of the sun. It felt a relief, almost like standing in shade. The man's eyes smiled at seeing the look on her face. Good, yes? he asked through his own thin black mask. Yes, Jensen said. Thank you for your help. But we must pay you for these things you gave us. With a twinkle in his eye, he said, You already have. The man turned to Sebastian, still pulling his black scarf over his head. I have told you all I can, all we know. My men and I go now. Before Sebastian could answer, the man was already hurrying across the parched ground toward the dark knot of men waiting with their dusty mules. The men started away, pulling their mules after on lead lines, eager to be away from the soldiers. They were headed south, in the opposite direction of the approaching rider. If it might be one of their men, Sebastian said almost to himself, then why are they leaving? 
He looked impatiently to the small trail where Sister Perdita had disappeared and then signaled to his column of men still waiting on horseback. The grim-looking force of men advanced across the hard ground, raising a lazy fog of dust. We have to go down there, Sebastian said, as he gestured toward the valley that held the pillars of creation. Wait up here until we get back. The officer at the head of the column folded his wrists across the horn of his saddle. What do you want us to do about that, he asked. His greasy strings of hair fell forward over his shoulder as he pointed with his chin toward the yet distant rider. Sebastian turned and watched the far-off horse galloping toward them. If he turns out to be suspicious for any reason at all, kill him. This is too important to risk trouble now. The officer gave Sebastian a single nod. Jensen could see in the hungry eyes and humorless grins of the men behind him that they were pleased by the orders. Let's go, Sebastian said. I want to catch up with Sister Perdita before she gets too far ahead of us. Don't worry, Jensen said. I want Lord Rahl more than Sister Perdita does. Chapter 58 The heat had been withering up on the barren plain, but venturing down the trail felt like descending into a blast furnace. Every breath drew the torrid air into her lungs, making Jensen feel as if she were being cooked from the inside, too. The air rising before the steep walls wavered like heat shimmering above a fire. There were places where the trail simply vanished, crossing loose rock, or perhaps went under it. In other places, a depression had been worn into the soft sandstone to show the way. In some places, the track went along natural pathways, so it was largely self-evident, with little choice to make a mistake. Occasionally, they had to cross slides of scree that had buried any trace of a trail and hoped they could pick it up farther along. Jensen knew enough about trails to know that this one was ancient and unused. Although nothing could make the scorching heat any less, the black garments that the traders had given them were at least an improvement. The black cloth around her eyes cut the painful glare, absorbing the bright light, making it easier to see. It was a relief to have the dark cloth shading her face. Instead of making her hotter, as she thought, the thin cloth covering the exposed skin of her arms and neck stopped the sun from burning her, and somehow seemed to keep some of the heat out. As she and Sebastian hurried to follow the trail ever downward, she soon found, to her dismay, that it led them up again, over one of the fingers of ridges that extended down into the valley. The rocky ground was so rugged that it would be difficult, if not impossible, to simply go right down, so the trail cut across the ridges, so it wouldn't drop so precipitously. The trade-off was that it made it necessary to descend the backside of one ridge only to have to climb the face of the next. They had no choice but to follow it, as it made a harrowing descent, then rose again. The strain on the muscles of her thighs and shins was fatiguing, but then to have to climb up again in such heat was agonizing. Jensen remembered well that Sebastian had once told her that no one ever risked going into the valley that held the pillars of creation. She could see why. By the unused nature of the trail, she knew that it was true, at least in this one place. She recalled, too, that he'd said that if anyone did go into the central valley, they had never returned to talk about it. She guessed that she didn't have to worry about that. As they went lower, yawning fissures and deep cuts opened in the craggy terrain, giving rise to rock walls that stood alone, as if cast off and abandoned. As they moved along the edges of vast cliffs, some of the spires made up of those splits rose up from below almost to their height at the valley rim. Looking down on such soaring towers of rock was dizzying. There were places where she and Sebastian were forced to make leaps across deep clefts, to see in places where they were going to have to follow the trail below was heart-stopping. Sister Perdita stood at the top of one of the prominent ridges along the trail's torturous descent, waiting for them, watching them with silent displeasure set enduringly in the lines of her implacable face. The growing shadows cast across the landscape added a strange new dimension to the place. The lowering sun highlighted the rugged features in a way that only helped to make clear how formidable the land truly was. 
Sebastian put a hand to Jensen's back and hurried her along an open level place in the trail as they moved in among the eerie rock columns that stood like imposing dead trunks of tree that had lost their crowns and all their limbs. Ever since they'd left the traders, something had felt wrong to Jensen. But as Sebastian spurred her along, she couldn't bring to mind precisely what it was that was bothering her. Sister Perdita scowled as she waited. Jensen checked that her knife was still there, as she had done countless times before. She sometimes simply brushed her fingertips across the silver handle. This time she lifted it to make sure it was clear in its sheath, then pressed it back down until it seated with the reassuring metallic click. The first time she had seen the knife when she found the dead Daharan soldier, she had thought it a remarkable weapon. She still thought so. That first time, seeing the ornate letter R had terrified her, with good reason. But now the touch of the engraved handle reassured her, giving her hope that she could at long last end the threat. This was the day she was finally about to accomplish. What Sebastian had told her that first night, she was going to use something close to her enemy to strike back. Sebastian had been through a difficult time, too, since that first night, when he'd had to fight those men, even though he had been stricken with a fever. She could never forget how brave he had been that day, and how he had fought despite having a fever. Far worse than being stricken with fever, though, he had been struck down by Addie's sorceress magic and nearly killed. Jensen was thankful that he had recovered, and that he was well, and that he would have a life, even if it was to be without her. Sebastian, she said, suddenly realizing that she had never said her goodbye to him. She didn't want to say it in front of Sister Perdita. She halted, turning back, pulling the black scarf away from her mouth. Sebastian, I just want to thank you for all you've done to help me. He laughed a little through the mask of black fabric. Jan, you sound like you're about to die. How could she tell him that she was? We can't know what will happen. Don't worry, he said cheerfully. You'll be fine. The sisters helped you with their magic while they were healing me, and now Sister Perdita will be there with you. I'll be there too. You'll at last avenge your mother. He didn't know what price the sisters had placed on their help and on vengeance. Jensen couldn't bear to tell him, but she had to find a way to say something. Sebastian, if anything happens to me... Jen, he said, taking hold of her arms, looking into her eyes, don't talk like that. He turned suddenly morose. Jen, don't say such a thing. I couldn't stand the thought of life without you. I love you, only you. You don't know what you mean to me. How you've made my life different than I ever thought it would be. So much better than I ever thought life could be. I couldn't go on without you. I couldn't ever again endure life without you. You make the world right for me as long as I have you. I'm hopelessly, helplessly in love with you. Please don't torture me with the thought of ever being without you. Jensen stared into his blue eyes, blue like her murdering father's eyes were said to have been, and she was unable to bring forth any words to explain, to say how she felt, to tell him that she was going to be taken from him and he would have to face life alone. She knew how awful it was to feel alone. She simply nodded as she turned back to the trail and veiled the black scarf back across her face. Hurry, she said. Sister Perdita is waiting. The woman scowled at Jensen through her own dark mask as she stood waiting in the wind atop a broad, flat rock. Jensen could see that the trail beyond the sister descended steeply among the shadows down into the very pillars of creation. As they approached, Jensen realized that Sister Perdita wasn't frowning at her, but looking past her, staring back the way they had come. Before they reached her, up on the flat rock where her black robes lifted in the sweltering gusts, they, too, turned to see what she was watching so intently. Jensen could see from their high vantage point that in their efforts they had reached the top of a divide in the trail from where it dropped rapidly down, following the side of the ridge to take them to the bottom. But looking back across the wide gorges and rocky ridges they had already crossed, she saw that they were almost as high again as the valley rim. There, she could see the small cluster of squat buildings looking tiny in the distance. The rider was almost there, charging in on his horse, following an arrow straight route toward the trail. The company of a thousand men had gathered in a thick line not far from the trailhead, waiting for him. Dust rose in a long plume behind the galloping horse. 
As the lathered animal raced in at full speed, before it reached the men, Jensen detected a falter in its gait. The horse's front legs abruptly crumpled. The poor beast went down, crashing to the rocky ground, dead from exhaustion. The man atop the horse smoothly stepped off the animal as it collapsed to the ground. Without seeming to lose momentum or stride, he continued to advance toward the trail. He was dressed in dark clothes, although not like those of the nomadic traders. A golden-colored cape billowed behind him, and he appeared to be a lot bigger than the traders. As he made straight for the trail, the commander of the cavalry cried out for the man to halt. He didn't challenge them or seem to even say a word. He simply ignored them as he marched resolutely past the buildings on his way to the trailhead. The thousand men raised a shrill battle cry and charged. The poor man brandished no weapon, made no threatening move toward the soldiers. As the order cavalry raced down on him, he lifted an arm toward them as if warning them to halt. Jensen knew from both Sebastian's orders and from the way they charged toward the lone man that they had no intention of stopping for anything short of his head. Jensen watched with dread as a man was about to be killed, watched spellbound as the thousand men crashed in toward him. The valley rim abruptly lit with a thunderous explosion. Despite the dark head wrap, Jensen shielded her eyes as she gasped in surprise. The violent rope of lightning and its terrible counterpart had twined together. A blazing white-hot bolt of lightning twisted together with a crackling black line that looked to be a void in the world itself, terrible power joined and discharged in an explosive instant. In the space of a heartbeat, it seemed as if all the glaring brightness of the barren plain, the fierce heat of the pillars of creation, had been gathered at a single point and unleashed. In an instant, the ignition of that explosive lightning annihilated the force of a thousand in a brilliantly lit red cloud. When the blinding light, the thunderous roar, the violent concussion were suddenly gone, so were the thousand men. All of them leveled. Among the smoking remains of horse and man, the lone man marched ever onward toward the trail, appearing not to have lost a step. In that man's determined movement, even more than in the way he had loosed havoc, Jensen saw the true depths of his terrible rage. Dear spirits, Jensen whispered, what just happened? Salvation comes only through self-sacrifice, Sister Perdita said. Those men died in service to the Order and thus the Creator. That is the Creator's highest calling. No need to mourn for them. They have gained salvation through loyal duty. Jensen could only stare at her. Who is that? Sebastian asked as he watched the lone man reach the rim of the valley of the Pillars of Creation and start down without pause. Do you have any ideas? It isn't important, Sister Perdita turned back to the trail. We have a mission. Then we had better hurry, Sebastian said in a worried tone as he stared back at the distant figure advancing down the trail at a swift, measured, relentless pace. Chapter 59 Jensen and Sebastian rushed to follow after Sister Perdita, who had disappeared over the top of the ridge. As they reached the edge, they saw her, already far below them. Jensen looked back in the direction of the trailhead, but didn't see the lone man. She did see, though, that a bank of dark clouds had rolled in over the expanse of barren plains. Hurry! Sister Perdita called back up to them. With Sebastian's hand at the small of her back, urging her on, Jensen dashed down the steep trail. The sister moved as swiftly as the wind, the black robes flying out behind her as she raced along a trail cut into the slope of steep rock. Jensen had never worked so hard to keep up with anyone. She suspected that the woman was using magic to aid her. Whenever Jensen started to lose her footing on the loose scree and reached out for support, the rough rock rasped the skin on her fingers and the palms of her hands. The trail was as arduous as any she had ever climbed down. Loose rock atop layers of solid ledge constantly slipped and gave way underfoot, and she knew that if she grabbed the wrong handhold, the rock, in many places as sharp as shattered glass, would slice her hands open. Jensen was soon panting and trying to catch her breath as well as the distant sister. Sebastian right behind sounded just as winded. 
Rocky II lost his footing a number of times, and once Jensen cried out and grabbed his arm just before he went over the edge of a precipitous drop of thousands of feet. The look in his eyes expressed the relief that he was too winded to voice. Finding herself closer to the bottom after a seemingly unending arduous descent, Jensen was at least relieved to note that the walls and towers were blocking the broiling sunlight. She glanced up at the sky, something she hadn't had the luxury to do for quite a while, and realized that it wasn't just the shadows cast by a rock darkening the day. The sky, that only hours before had been so clear and bright blue, was now roofed with churning gray clouds, as if the entire valley of the pillars of creation were being sealed off from the rest of the world. She forged onward, rushing to keep up with Sister Perdita. There was no time to worry about clouds. As exhausted as Jensen was, she knew that when the time came, she would find the strength to plunge her knife into Richard Rawl. That time was almost at hand. She knew that her mother, with the good spirits, would inspire her and thus help give her the strength. She knew, too, that other strength had been promised. Rather than filling her with dread, knowing that the end of her life was so close left Jensen with an odd, numb sense of calm. It seemed almost sweet that promise of the end of struggle, the end of fear, the end of needing to care about anything. Soon there would be no exhaustion, no insufferable heat, no pain, no sorrow, no anguish. At the same time, when for only an instant here or a moment there, she actually comprehended the staggering reality that she was about to die, her mind blanked out with overwhelming terror. It was her life, her only precious life, that was inexorably dwindling away that would soon end with the cold embrace of death itself. Flickering lightning skipped across a darkening sky, traveling under the clouds. Distant, intense flashes came again, lacing through the heavy clouds, lighting them from within with spectacular green light. Distant thunder boomed, rumbling out across the vast deserted valley. The hesitant rolling sound of the thunder seemed to match the way the landscape wavered in the heat. As they descended, the towering rock columns became larger, at first growing up from splits along the ridges, until down at the bottom they seemed rooted in the floor of the valley itself. Now, as the three of them moved at last ever farther away from the cliffs and out into the valley, those columns rose up like an ancient stone forest. Jensen felt like an ant moving among them. As their footsteps echoed among the rock walls, chambers, and tiers, she couldn't help marveling at the smooth, rippled sides of the pillars that looked as if the rock had been worn smooth like stones in a river. Different layers within the vertical rock appeared to be of varying density, making them wear at different rates, leaving the stone towers rippled up along their entire length. In places, huge sections of the columns perched atop narrow necks. All the while, the heat felt like a great weight pressing down on her as her feet dragged through the jagged gravel at the bottom. The light among the columns cast eerie shadows, leaving dark places lurking farther back in among the towers. In other places, light seemed to come from behind the stone. As she looked up, it was like looking up from the depths of the world, seeing the rock itself lit green at times by the flickering lightning within the clouds, reach up as if beseeching salvation. Sister Perdita glided among the maze of rock like a spirit of the dead, her black robes billowing out behind. Even Sebastian's presence behind was not a comfort for Jensen among such silent sentinels to the power of creation itself. Lightning arced across above their heads, above the tops of towering rock, as if searching the forest of stone. Thunder shook the valley with violent shudders that brought crumbling rock down on them so that they had to run or dodge to the side to avoid being stoned. Jensen saw here and there where some of the enormous pillars had previously come crashing down. They lay toppled now like fallen giants. In places they had to pass beneath the monumental stone lying across the path, walking through passages left where the colossal pieces spanned weathered gaps. She hoped the lightning that was streaking all across the sky didn't decide to hit a stone pillar right above them and send unimaginable weight crashing down on them. Just when Jensen thought that they would be forever lost in among the tight spaces among soaring rock, 
she saw an opening between the towers that revealed the expanse of the rest of the valley floor. Winding their way along the bottom, among the crowded stone columns, they began to wend their way out into more open ground, where the pillars stood as individual monuments rather than being tightly crammed together. Down at the bottom, the valley that had looked so flat from above was a jumble of rolling low rock and scree, cut through with jagged rock formations and lifted slabs of smooth stone that ran for miles. Out from the fingers of tapering ridges coming in from the side stood lofty pillars, both separated and in small clusters. The thunder was becoming unnerving as it boomed and shuddered and rumbled almost continually through the forest of stone. The sky had lowered until the boiling clouds brushed along the surrounding walls of rock. Off at the far end of the valley, the darkest clouds threw out almost constant flickers and flashes, some startlingly bright, spawning, jarring thunderclaps. Coming past a broad stone spire, Jensen was startled to see a wagon in the distance making its way across the valley floor. Jensen turned to tell Sebastian about the wagon, and there, behind them, towered the stranger. Her gaze took in his black shirt, his black open-sided tunic decorated with ancient symbols snaking along a wide gold band running all the way around its squared edges. The tunic was cinched at his waist with a wide, multi-layered leather belt with leather pouches attached along each side. The small, gold-worked leather compartments on the belt bore silver emblems of linked rings, matching those on wide, leather-padded silver bands at each wrist. His trousers and boots were black. In contrast, his broad shoulders bore a cape that appeared to be made of spun gold. He had no weapon but a belt knife but he needed none to be the embodiment of threat itself. Looking into his gray eyes, Jensen knew instantly and unequivocally that she was staring into the raptor gaze of Richard Rawl. It felt as if a fist of fear seized her heart and squeezed. Jensen pulled her knife free. She clutched it so tightly that her knuckles were white around the silver hilt. She could feel the ornately engraved letter R for the house of Rawl biting into her palm and fingers as the Lord Rawl himself stood right there before her. Sebastian spun around and saw him, then moved around behind her. Her emotions in a jumble, Jensen stood paralyzed before her brother. Jen, Sebastian whispered from behind, don't worry, you can do this. Your mother is watching. Don't let her down. Richard Rawl scrutinized her, not seeming to notice Sebastian or even Sister Perdita farther back. Jensen stared at her brother, equally oblivious of the other two. Where is Kalen? Richard said. His voice was not what she expected. It was commanding, to be sure, but it was so much more, so full of emotion. Everything from cold fury to unwavering resolve to desperation. His gray eyes, too, reflected the same sincere and terrible determination. Jensen could not take her eyes from him. Who is Kalen? The mother confessor, my wife. Jensen could not move, so conflicted was she in what she was seeing, in what she was hearing. This was not a man looking for a monster cohort, a brutal confessor who ruled the Midlands with an iron will and an evil hand. This was a man motivated by love for this woman. Jensen could clearly see that little else mattered to him. If they did not get out of his way, he would go through them like he went through those thousand men. It was as simple as that. Except, unlike those thousand men, Jensen was invincible. Where is Kalen? Richard repeated, his patience at an end. You killed my mother, Jensen said almost defensively. His brow twitched. He seemed truly puzzled. I only just learned that I have a sister. Friedrich Gilder just told me and that your name is Jensen. Jensen realized she was nodding, unable to take her eyes off his, seeing her own eyes in his. Kill him, Jen, Sebastian whispered urgently in her ear. Kill him. You can do it. His magic can't hurt you. Do it. Jensen felt a kind of tingling dread working its way up her legs. Something was wrong. Gripping the knife, she gathered her courage of purpose as the voice filled her head until there was no room for anything else. The Lord Rawl has been trying to murder me my whole life. 
When you killed your father, you took his place. You sent men after me. You've hounded me just like your father. You sent the quads after us. You bastard, you sent those men who murdered my mother. Richard listened without argument and then spoke in a calm, deliberate voice. Don't lay a cloak of guilt around my shoulders because others are evil. Jensen was jolted, realizing that was very close to the words her mother had used the night before she died. Don't you ever wear a cloak of guilt because they are evil. The muscles in his jaw flexed as he gritted his teeth. What have you done with Kaelin? She's my queen now, came a voice echoing through the columns. Jensen vaguely recognized the voice. As she looked around, she didn't see Sister Perdita anywhere. Richard passed her, already moving toward the voice, like a shadow moving by. And then he was suddenly gone. She had missed her chance to stab him. She couldn't believe that he had been standing right in front of her, and she had missed her chance. Jen, Sebastian called, pulling at her arm. What's the matter with you? Come on! You can still get him! She didn't know what was wrong. Something was. She pressed her hands to her head, trying to stop the drone of the voice. She no longer could. She had made a bargain, and the voice was mercilessly demanding that she hold to it, crushing her mind with pain unlike any she had ever suffered. When Jensen heard laughter echoing through the forest of stone pillars, she moved swiftly, the heat and her exhaustion forgotten. She and Sebastian ran toward the sound, weaving their way among the disorder of towering rock. She no longer knew where she was, which way was which. She raced through stone passageways that opened up to others, along their twisting course, under archways of rock, among columns, and through shadows and light. It was like moving through a strange and confusing combination of corridors and woods, except that these walls were stone, not plaster, and the trees were rock. As they came around an immense pillar, there, among others standing like sentinels, was an open area of undulating smooth rock in a jumble of curves with smaller stone columns as thick around as ancient pines. A woman was tied to one of the columns. There was no doubt in Jensen's mind that this was Richard's wife, Kaylin, the mother confessor. Off in another direction came the echoing laughter, teasing, leading Richard away from what he sought. The mother confessor didn't look like the monster Jensen had pictured. She looked in bad shape, limp in the ropes around the pillar. She was not bound securely, but simply with rope around her middle as a child might tie a playmate to a tree. She was apparently unconscious, some of her long mass of hair pendant around her hanging head, her arms swinging free. She wore simple traveling clothes, though neither they nor the partial veil of hair hid what a beautiful woman she was. She looked only a few years older than Jensen. She didn't look like she would live to be any older. Sister Perdita appeared suddenly beside the woman, lifting the mother confessor's head by her hair, taking a look, then letting her head drop again. Sebastian ran up, pointing. That's her. Come on. As Jensen followed, she didn't need the voice in her head to tell her that this was the bait that had been provided in order to draw Richard Rawl in for the killing. The voice had done its part. Girding her resolve, gripping her knife tightly, Jensen ran over beside the sister. She turned her back to the unconscious woman, not wanting to think about her or to have to look at her, putting her mind instead to the task at hand. This was her chance to finish it. The laughing man suddenly popped out from behind a pillar not far away, no doubt to help draw in the prey. Jensen recognized his awful grin. It was the man she had seen the night the sorceress Lethea had been murdered. It was the man that had so frightened Betty, her goat. The man Jensen thought she recognized from her nightmares. I see you have found my queen, the nightmare man said. What? Sebastian asked. My queen, the man said, still with that terrible grin. I am King Oberal. She shall be my queen. Jensen recognized then that there was a small resemblance in the eyes to Nathan Rawl, to Richard, to her. He didn't have the strong likeness that Jensen saw of herself in Richard's eyes, but she saw enough to know that he was telling the truth. He, too, was the son of Darken Rawl. Here he comes, he said, turning holding out an introductory arm. My brother, the old Lord Rahl. Richard
Richard strode out of the shadows. Don't be afraid, Jen, Sebastian whispered in her ear. He can't hurt you. You can get him now. Now was her chance. She would not again waste it. Off to the side, through the thicket of columns, she caught glimpses of a wagon rolling up. She thought she recognized the horses, both gray with black manes and tails. They were horses as big as any she'd ever seen. From the corner of her eye, she saw that the driver was big and blonde-headed. Jensen turned, staring in disbelief at the wagon when she heard Betty's familiar bleat. The goat stood and put its front hooves up on the seat beside the driver. The big blonde man gave her ears a quick affectionate rub. It looked like Tom. Jensen, Richard said, step away from Kalen. Don't do it, sis, Oba yelled. He roared with laughter. Knife in hand, Jensen backed closer to the unconscious woman hanging from the pillar rising up behind. Richard would try to come through her to get at Kalen. Then Jensen would have him. Jensen, Richard said, why would you side with a sister of the dark? She shot a brief, puzzled frown at Sister Perdita. Sister of the light, she corrected. Richard slowly shook his head as his gaze went beyond to Sister Perdita. No, she is a sister of the dark. Jagang has sisters of the light, but he also has the others as well. They are both slaves to the Dreamwalker. That's why they have that ring through their lower lip. Jensen had heard that name before, Dreamwalker. She frantically tried to remember where. She recalled, too, what the sisters had invoked that night in the woods. Everything was tumbling through her mind in a frantic rush. It wasn't helping that the voice was there, incessantly urging her on. She was screaming inside with the need to kill this man, but something was keeping her from moving. She knew it couldn't be his magic. You will have to come through Jensen if you want to save Kalin, Sister Perdita said in her cool, disdainful voice. You have run out of time and options, Lord Rao. You had better at least save your wife before her time is up as well. Off in the distance to the side, Jensen caught sight of the brown goat bounding through the forest of stone, outpacing Tom by a wide margin. Betty? Jensen whispered through choking tears as she unwrapped the black veil from her head so the goat would recognize her. The goat bleated at the sound of her name, her little upright tail wagging in a blur as she ran. Something else, smaller, was coming from behind, back by Tom. Before the goat could reach her, it reached Oba. Spotting him as it came around the pillar, Betty let out a plaintive cry and sidestepped away. Jensen knew well Betty's cry of distress and terror her plea for help and comfort. Overhead, the sky went wild with lightning and thunder, further frightening the poor animal. Betty? Jensen called, hardly able to believe what she was seeing, wondering if it could be an illusion, some cruel deception. But Lord Rawl's magic couldn't do that to her. At the sound of her voice, the goat bounded toward Jensen, her beloved lifelong friend. Not a dozen strides away, Betty looked up at Jensen and froze in her tracks. The wagging tail stopped dead. Betty bleated in distress. The bleats turned to terror at what she was seeing. Betty, Jensen cried, it's all right, come, it's me. Trembling in fear as it gazed up at her, Betty backed away. The goat was reacting the same way it had to Oba just now, and the same way it had that first night she saw him. Betty turned and ran, right for Richard. He crouched down as the goat, clearly in distress, came running, seeking comfort, and found it under a sheltering hand. Stunned, Jensen then heard other little bleats. Small little twin white goats came capering into the midst of all the people, into the middle of a deadly confrontation. They spooked at the sight of the man, turned, and at the sight of Jensen shrank back, crying out for their mother. Betty bleated, calling to them. They spun and raced for her protection. With their mother there, they felt safe and jumped up on Richard, eager for the reassuring touch their mother was getting. Tom had stopped well back, waiting near a pillar as he watched, obviously intending to stay clear. Jensen thought that, surely, the world must have gone mad. Chapter 60 Betty, what are you doing? Jensen asked, unable to reconcile in her mind what was happening. Magic! 
Sister Perdita whispered from behind in answer to Jensen's puzzled tone. It's his doing. Could it be that Richard Rawl had bewitched even her goat, turned it against her? Richard took a step toward her. Betty and her twins romped around his legs, having no conception of the life and death events taking place before them. Jensen, use your head, Richard said. Think for yourself. You have to help me now. Step away from Caelan. Kill him, Sebastian whispered with vicious determination. Do it, Jen. Magic can't hurt you. Do it. Jensen lifted her knife as Richard calmly watched her. She felt herself stepping toward him. When she killed him, then his magic would die too, and Betty would know her once again. Jensen froze. Something was wrong. She turned to Sebastian. How do you know? How do you know that? I never told you that magic can't harm me. You too? Oba called. He'd come closer. We're both invincible then. We can rule Dahara together. But I'll be the king, of course. King Oberall. I'm not greedy, though. You could be a princess, maybe. Yes, I could let you be a princess if you're good. Jensen's eyes turned back toward Sebastian's surprised face. How do you know? Jen, I just... I thought, he stammered, trying to find an answer. Richard. It was Kalen, waking, but groggy. Richard, where are we? She winced in pain and cried out, even though no one touched her. When Richard took a step toward her, Jensen stepped back before her, brandishing her knife. If you want her, you must come through Jensen, Sister Perdita said. Richard watched her without emotion for a long moment. No. You must, the sister growled. You will have to kill Jensen or Kalen will die. Are you crazy? Sebastian yelled at the sister. Get a hold of yourself, Sebastian, the sister snapped. Salvation comes only through sacrifice. All of mankind is corrupt. One individual is unimportant. One life is meaningless. It matters not what happens to her. Only her sacrifice matters. Sebastian stared at her, unable to answer, unable to find a reason to argue for Jensen's life. You'll have to kill Jensen, Sister Perdita shrieked as she turned back to Richard, or I will kill Kalen. Richard, Kalen moaned, clearly not understanding where she was or what was happening. Kalen, Richard said in a calm voice, stay still. Last chance, Sister Perdita screamed. Last chance to save the Mother Confessor's precious life. Last chance before the Keeper has her. Stop him, Jensen, while I kill his wife. Jensen was staggered that the sister would be encouraging him to kill her. It made no sense. It was Lord Rawl that the sister wanted dead. It was Lord Rawl they all wanted dead. Jensen knew she had to end it. She couldn't be hurt by his magic. How Sebastian knew that, she couldn't fathom, but she had to end it now while she had the chance. Why the sister was doing this, though, was a mystery. Unless Sister Perdita was trying to anger Richard so that he would lash out with his magic, strike with his power at Jensen, thus giving her the opening she finally needed. That had to be it. Jensen dared not wait. Unleashing a cry of fury filled with a lifetime of hate, filled with the burning agony of her mother's murder, Filled with the howling rage of the voice in her head, Jensen launched herself at Richard. She knew he would hurl his magic at her in order to save himself, unleash magic at her as he had unleashed it at the thousand men. He would be shocked that it didn't work, shocked as she burst through his deadly conjuring at the last instant to suddenly plunge her knife through his evil heart. He would know too late that she was invincible. Screaming her rage, Jensen flew at him. She expected a horrific blast, expected to fly through the lightning, thunder, smoke, but it never came. He caught her wrist in his fist. Simple as that. He used no magic. He cast no spell. He invoked no wizardly power. Jensen had no immunity to muscle, and he had plenty of that. Calm down, Richard said. She fought him furiously, an angry storm throwing all her hate and pain into her onslaught. He securely held her knife-wielding fist as she raged, her other fist pounding against his chest. He could have snapped her in two with his bare hands, but he instead let her scream and strike out at him, 
then let her yank herself back away to stand in the center of everyone, panting, knife held up, tears of anger and hate streaming down her cheeks. Kill her or Kaelin dies, Sister Perdita shrieked again. Sebastian shoved the sister back. Have you lost your mind? She can do it. He isn't even armed. Richard pulled a small book from one of the pouches at his belt and held it up. Oh, but I am. What do you mean? Jensen asked. His raptor gaze settled on her. This is an ancient text titled The Pillars of Creation. It was written by some of our ancestors, Jensen. Those among the first to be Lord Rall, among the first who came to understand the full extent of what had been engendered by the first of the line, Alric Rall, who created the bond, among other things. It's very interesting reading. I suppose it says that as Lord Rall you should kill those like me, Jensen said. Richard smiled. You're right, it does. What? She could hardly believe that he would admit it. It really says that? He nodded. It explains why all the truly ungifted offspring of the Lord Rall, the Lord Rall who carries down the gift of the bond to his people, must be killed. I knew it, Jensen cried. You tried to lie, but it's true. It's all right there. I didn't say that I would take the advice. I only said that the book says that your kind are to be killed. Why? Jensen asked. Jan, it doesn't matter, Sebastian whispered. Don't listen to him. Richard gestured to Sebastian. He knows why. That's why he knew you couldn't be harmed by my magic. He knew because he knows what's in the book. Jensen spun to Sebastian, her eyes wide with sudden understanding. Emperor Jagang has that book. Jen, you're just talking nonsense now. I saw it, Sebastian. The Pillars of Creation. I saw it in his tent. It's an ancient book in his old tongue. It's one of his prized books. He knew what it says. You are one of his prized strategists. He told you. You knew all along what it said. Jen, I... It was you, she whispered. How can you doubt me? I love you. Then, over the terrible tumult of the voice, the whole thing began unraveling in her mind. The crushing pain of it all came crashing in on her. The true dimensions of the betrayal became horrifyingly clear. Dear spirits, it was you all along. Sebastian, his face going nearly as white as his white spikes of hair, turned deadly calm. Jen, that doesn't change anything. It was you, she whispered wide-eyed. You took a single mountain fever, Rose. What? I don't even have any such thing. I saw them in a tin in your pack. There was twine on top of them hiding them. They spilled out. Oh, those. I, I got them from the healer, the one we visited. Liar. You had them all along. You took one to give yourself a fever. Jen, now you're just acting crazy. Trembling, Jensen pointed at him with her knife. It was you all along. That first night you told me, where I come from, we believe in using what is closest to an enemy or what comes from him as a weapon against him. You wanted me to have this knife. You wanted me because I was closest to your enemy. You wanted to use me. How did you get it on that soldier? Jen, you claim to love me? Prove it. Don't lie to me. Tell me the truth. Sebastian stared a moment before finally holding his head up and answering. I only wanted to gain your trust. I thought that if I had a fever, you would take me in. And the dead soldier I found? He was one of my men. We captured the man who carried that knife. I gave it to one of my men, had him dress in a Daharan uniform, then, after we saw you pass below, I pushed him over the cliff. You killed your own man? Sacrifice for the greater cause is sometimes necessary. Salvation comes through sacrifice, he added in defiant defense. How did you know where I was? Emperor Jagang is a dreamwalker. He learned about your kind through the book years ago. He used his ability to search for any who might know of your existence. Over time, he put together evidence in order to track you down. And the note I found? I planted it on him. Jagang found out through his ability that you once used that name. The bond prevents the dreamwalker from entering a person's mind, Richard said. He must have searched for a long time looking for those who aren't bonded to the Lord Rall. Sebastian nodded with satisfaction.
That's right, and we succeeded too. Jensen burning with blinding anger, with the agony of such monumental betrayal swallowed. And the rest? My mother? Was that one of your necessary sacrifices too? Sebastian licked his lips. Jen, you don't understand. I didn't really know you then. They were your own men. That's why it was so easy for you to kill them. They weren't expecting you to attack them. They thought you were there to fight alongside them. And that's why you were confused when I told you about the quads, about how many more men I thought there were. They weren't really quads. You had to kill some innocent people along the way in order to make me think it was the other member of a quad. All those times you went out at night to scout and came back saying they were right behind us and we kept running through the night, you made it all up. To a good cause, Sebastian said quietly. Jensen gasped in her tears, her fury. A good cause? You killed my mother. It was you all along. Dear spirits, to think that I... Oh, dear spirits, I slept with my mother's murderer, you filthy... Jen, get a hold of yourself. It was necessary. He pointed at Richard. This is the cause of it all. We have him now. This was all necessary. Salvation only comes through selfless sacrifice. Your sacrifice, your mother's sacrifice, has captured us, Richard Rahl, the man who has hunted you your whole life. Tears of rage poured down her face. I can't believe you could have done such things to me and claimed to love me. But I do, Jen. I didn't know you then. I told you I never intended to fall in love with you, but I did. It just happened. You are my life now. I love you now. She pressed her hands to the voice screaming in her head. You are evil. I could never love you. Brother Narev teaches that all of mankind is evil. We can have no moral existence because mankind is a taint on the world of life. At least Brother Narev is at last in a better place. He's with the Creator now. You mean to say that even Brother Narev is evil then? Because he is part of mankind? Even your precious, sacred Brother Narev was evil? Sebastian glared at her. The one who is truly evil is standing right there, he pointed. Richard Rahl for killing a great man. Richard Rahl must be put to death for his crimes. If mankind is evil, and if Brother Narev is in a better place with the Creator, then Richard has done a kindness by killing Brother Narev, by sending him into the Creator's arms, hasn't he? And if mankind is evil, then how could Richard Rahl be evil for killing men of the Order? Sebastian's face had gone red. We are all evil, but some are more evil than others. At least we have the humility before the Creator to recognize our own wickedness and to glorify only the Creator. He paused and cooled visibly. I know it's a sign of weakness, but I love you. He gave her a smile. You have become my only reason for being, Jen. She could only stare at him. You don't love me, Sebastian. You don't have any idea what love really is. You can't love anyone or anything until you love your own existence first. Love can only grow out of a respect for your own life. When you love yourself, your own existence, then you can love someone who can enhance your existence, share it with you, and make it more pleasurable. When you hate yourself and believe your existence is evil, then you can only hate. You can only experience the shell of love, that longing for something good. But you have nothing to base it in but hatred. You taint the very concept of love, Sebastian, with your corrupted longing for it. You want me only to justify your hatred, to be your partner in self-loathing. To truly love someone, Sebastian, you must revel in their existence because they make life all the more wonderful. If you think existence is corrupt, then you are sealed off from the fruition of such a relationship, from what love really is. You're wrong. You just don't understand. I understand all too well. I only wish I had sooner. But I do love you, Jen. You're wrong. I do love you. You can only wish you did. They are the empty words of a barren shell of a man. There is nothing there for me to love, nothing worth loving. You are so empty of humanity that it's even difficult for me to hate you, Sebastian, except in the sense of the way one would hate an open sewer. Lightning crashed down on the pillars all around. The voice in Jensen's head felt as if it would tear her apart. Jen, you don't mean any of that. You can't. I can't live without you. Jensen turned her cold fury on him. 
The only thing in the whole world that you could do that would please me, Sebastian, would be to die. I've listened to this touching lover's spat long enough, Sister Perdita growled. Sebastian, be a man and shut your mouth or I'll shut it for you. Your life means just as little as anyone else's. Richard, you have a choice, Jensen or the Mother Confessor. You don't have to serve the Keeper, Sister, Richard said. You don't have to serve the Dreamwalker either. You have a choice. Sister Perdita pointed at him. You have a choice. I make you this offer once. Your time is up. Kalen's time is up. Jensen or Kalen, choose. I don't like your rules, Richard said. I choose neither. Then I choose for you. Your precious wife dies. Even as Jensen dove at her to stop her, Sister Perdita seized Kalen by the hair and lifted her head. The mother confessor's face was blank of all expression. Jensen caught Sister Perdita's arm, swinging the knife with the ornate letter R as fast as she could, with as much power as she could apply, hoping against hope that she was fast enough to save Kalen's life, yet knowing even as she made the attempt that she was already too late. There was a crystal clear instant when the world seemed to stop, to freeze in place, and then there was a violent concussion to the air, thunder without sound. The terrible shock drove a ring of dust and rock away from the Mother Confessor in an ever-expanding circle. The shock to the column so close all around shook the towering pillars. Some that were so precariously balanced toppled. As they fell, they hit others, bringing them down as well. It seemed to take forever for the huge sections of rock to plunge through the sweltering air, trailing dust as they disintegrated, plummeting down like thunder made of stone. As the rock came crashing to ground, it seemed the entire valley shook under the tremendous blows. Blinding dust swirled up into the air. The world went black, as if all light had been taken away. And in that terrifying instant, in the total blackness, it seemed that there was no world, no anything. The world came back, like a shadow lifting. Jensen found herself holding the arm of a dead woman. The sister toppled to the ground like one of the stone pillars. Jensen saw her knife jutting from the sister's chest. Richard was already there, holding Kaylin in his arms, slicing through the rope, easing her down. She looked drained, but other than her weakness, she looked fine. What happened? Jensen asked in wonder. Richard smiled at her. The sister made a mistake, I warned her. The mother confessor unleashed her power into Sister Perdita. Did you have to warn her? Kaylin asked, suddenly quite coherent sounding. She might have listened to you. No, it only encouraged her to do it. Jensen realized that the voice was gone. What happened? Did I kill her? No, she was dead before your knife touched her, Kaylin said. Richard was distracting her so I could use my power. You tried, but you were an instant too late. She was already mine. Richard put a comforting hand on Jensen's shoulder. You didn't kill her, but you made a choice that saved your own life. That shadow that passed over us as the sister died was the keeper of the dead, taking one who had sworn herself to him. Had you made the wrong choice, you would have been taken with her. Jensen's knees were trembling. The voice is gone, she whispered aloud. It's gone. The keeper inadvertently revealed his intent, Richard said. Since the hounds were loose, that meant the veil, the conduit between worlds, was open. I don't understand. Richard gestured with the book before he tucked it back into one of the pouches at his belt. Well, I haven't had time to read it all, but I've read enough to learn a little. You are an ungifted offspring of a Lord Rawl. That makes you the balance to the gifted Rawl, to magic. You not only have none, but you're not touched by it. In a time of a great war, the House of Rawl was created to give birth to a line of powerful wizards, but in so doing, it also sowed the seeds of the end of magic for the world. It may be the imperial order that wants a world without magic, but it is the House of Rawl that may eventually deliver it. You, Jensen Rawl, are potentially the most dangerous person alive, because you, like any truly ungifted Rawl, are the seed that could spawn a new world without magic. Jensen stared into his gray eyes. Then why would you not want me dead like every Lord Rawl before you? Richard smiled. You have as much right to your life as anyone else. 
as any Lord Rawl has ever had to their life. There is no right way for the world to be. The only right is that people be allowed to live their own life. Kalin pulled the knife from Sister Perdita's chest and cleaned it on the black robes before handing it to Jensen. Sister Perdita was wrong. Salvation is not through sacrifice. Your responsibility is to yourself. Your life is your own, Richard said, and not anyone else's. You made me proud, hearing everything you said to Sebastian. Jensen stared down at the knife in her hand, still dazed and confused by everything that was happening. She looked around in the gathering darkness, but didn't see Sebastian anywhere. Oba was gone, too. As she looked around, Jensen was startled to see a moored Sith standing not far away. This is just great, the woman complained to the mother confessor, throwing her hands up. The girl sounds like Lord Rawl. Now I'm going to have to listen to two of them. Kaylin smiled and sat down, leaning back against the pillar where she had been tied, watching Richard listening, stroking the ears of Betty's twin kids. Betty watched her two young ones, then, seeing them safe, peered hopefully up at Jensen. Her little tail started wagging in a blur. Betty? Betty happily jumped up on her, eager for a reunion. Jensen tearfully hugged the goat before standing to face her brother. But why would you not do as your ancestors? Why? How can you risk everything in that book? Richard hooked his thumbs behind his belt and took a deep breath. Life is the future, not the past. The past can teach us through experience how to accomplish things in the future, comfort us with cherished memories, and provide the foundation of what has already been accomplished. But only the future holds life. To live in the past is to embrace what is dead. To live life to its fullest each day must be created anew. As rational thinking beings, we must use our intellect, not a blind devotion to what has come before, to make rational choices. Life is the future, not the past, Jensen whispered to herself, considering all that life now held for her. Where did you ever hear such a thing? Richard grinned. It's the wizard's seventh rule. Jensen gazed up at him through her tears. You have given me a future, a life. Thank you. He embraced her then, and Jensen suddenly didn't feel alone in the world. She felt whole again. It felt so good to be held as she wept with tears for her mother and tears for the future, for the joy that there was life and a future. Kalin rubbed Jensen's back. Welcome to the family. When Jensen wiped her eyes and laughed at everything and nothing while she used her other hand to scratch Betty's ears, she saw then Tom standing nearby. Jensen ran to him and fell into his arms. Oh, Tom, you can't know how glad I am to see you. Thank you for bringing me, Betty. That's me, goat delivery as promised. Turns out that Irma, the sausage lady, only wanted your goat to get herself a kid. She has a billy and wanted a young one. She kept one and let you have the other two. Betty had three? Tom nodded. I'm afraid that I've become very fond of Betty and her two little ones. I can't believe that you did that for me. Tom, you're wonderful. My mother always said so, too. Don't forget you promised to tell Lord Rawl. Jensen laughed in delight. I promise. But how in the world did you ever find me? Tom smiled and pulled a knife from behind his back. Jensen was astonished to see that it was identical to the one she had. You see, he explained, I carry the knife in service to Lord Rawl. You do? Richard asked. I've never even met you. Oh, the Mord Sith said, Tom here is all right, Lord Rawl. I can vouch for him. Why, thank you, Kara, Tom said with a twinkle in his eye. And you knew all along then, Jensen asked, that I was making it all up? Tom shrugged. I wouldn't be a proper protector to Lord Rawl if I let such a suspicious person as you roam around trying to do harm without doing my best to find out what you were up to. I've kept tabs on you, followed you a goodly part of your journeying. Jensen swatted his shoulder. You've been spying on me. As a protector to Lord Rawl, I had to see what you were up to and to make sure you didn't harm Lord Rawl. Well, she said, I don't think you were doing a very good job of it then. What do you mean? Tom asked with exaggerated indignation. I could have really stabbed him. You just stood way over there the whole time, too far away to do anything about it. Tom smiled that boyish grin of his, but this time it was a little more mischievous than usual. Oh, I'd not have let you hurt Lord Rawl. Tom turned 
and heaved his knife. With blinding speed, such as she had never seen, the blade flew across the valley, embedding itself with a thunk in one of the faraway fallen stone pillars. Jensen squinted and saw that it had been driven through something dark. She followed Tom, Richard, Kalen, and the moored Sith between towering columns and stone rubble to where the knife was stuck. To Jensen's astonishment, it had impaled a leather pouch right through the center, being held up by a hand coming from beneath the huge section of fallen stone. Please, came a muffled voice from under the rock. Please let me out. I'll pay you. I can pay. I have my own money. It was Oba. The rock had fallen on him when he ran. It had landed on boulders that kept the main section of stone, big enough that twenty men couldn't have joined hands around it, from collapsing to the ground, leaving a tiny space, trapping the man alive under the tons of rock. Tom pulled his knife from the soft stone and retrieved the leather pouch. He waved it in the air. Friedrich, he called toward the wagon. A man sat up. Friedrich, is this yours? Jensen was astonished yet again in this astonishing day to see Friedrich Gilder, the husband of Althea, climb down from the wagon and make his way over to them. That's mine, he said. He looked under the rock. You have more. After a moment, the hand began passing out more leather and cloth purses. There, you have all my money. Let me out now. Oh, Friedrich said, I don't think I could lift that rock, especially not for the man who is responsible for the death of my wife. Althea died? Jensen asked in shock. I'm afraid so. My sunshine has gone from my life. I'm so sorry, she whispered. She was a good woman. Friedrich smiled. Yes, she was. He pulled a small, smooth stone from his pocket. But she left me this. And that much is a pleasure. Isn't that odd, Tom said in wonder. He fished around in his pocket until he came up with something. He opened his hand to reveal a small, smooth stone sitting in his palm. I have one of those, too. I always carry it as a good luck charm. Friedrich eyed him suspiciously. He grinned at last. She has smiled on you, too, then. I can't breathe, came a muffled voice from under the rock. Please, it hurts. I can't move. Let me out. Richard held his hand out toward the rock. There came a grinding sound and a sword floated from under the rock. He bent and pulled his scabbard out, dragging the baldric out behind. He wiped the dust off and placed the baldric over his shoulder, the scabbard at his hip. The sword was magnificent, a proper weapon for the Lord Rahl. Jensen saw the gleaming gold word, Truth, on the hilt. You faced all those soldiers, and you didn't even have your sword, Jensen said. I guess your magic was better defense. Richard smiled as he shook his head. My ability works through need and anger. With Kalen taken, I had plenty of need and a ready rage. He lifted the hilt clear of the scabbard until she could again see the word, spelled out in gold. This weapon works all the time. How did you know where we were? Jensen asked him. How did you know where Kalen was? Richard burnished a thumb over the single gold word on the hilt of his sword. My grandfather gave me this. King Oba there stole it when, with the keeper's help, he captured Kalen. This sword is rather special. I have a connection to it. I can sense where it is. The keeper no doubt induced Oba to take it in order to entice me here. Please, Oba called. I can't breathe. Your grandfather? Jensen asked, ignoring Oba's distress, his weeping. You mean Wizard Zorander? Richard's whole face softened with a splendid grin. You've met Zed, then. He's wonderful, isn't he? He tried to kill me, Jensen muttered. Zed? Richard scoffed. Zed's harmless. Harmless? He... The moored Sith, Kara, poked at Jensen with the red rod she had, the Aegeal. What are you doing? Jensen asked. Stop that. That doesn't do anything to you? No, Jensen said, scowling. No more than it did when Nida did it. Kara's eyebrow went up. You've met Nida? She looked up at Richard. And she can still walk. I'm impressed. She's immune to magic, Richard said. That's why your Aegeal won't work on her either. Kara, with a sly smile, looked over at Kalen. 
Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Kaylin asked. She might just be able to solve our little problem, Kara said, her wicked grin growing. Now, I suppose, Richard said in ill humor, you're going to have her touch it too. Well, Kara said defensively, someone has to. You don't want me to do it again, do you? No. What are you three talking about? Jensen asked. We have some urgent problems, Richard said. If you'd like to help, I think you just might have the special talent it takes to get us out of a serious bind. Really? You mean you want me to go with you? If you're willing, Kaylin said. She leaned on Richard, looking like she was at the end of her strength. Tom, Richard said, might we... Of course, Tom said, dashing over to offer his arm to Kaylin. Come on over. I have some nice blankets in back where you can lay down. Just ask Jensen. They're real comfortable. I'll drive you back up the easy way. That would be much appreciated, Richard said. It's just about dark. We'd better stay here for the night and ride out as soon as it's light enough, hopefully before it gets too hot. The rest of them will want to sit back there with the mother confessor, I expect, Tom whispered to Jensen. If you don't mind... You could ride up on the seat with me. First, I want to know something. The truth now, Jensen said. If you're a defender to Lord Rall, what would you have done standing over there if I had harmed Lord Rall? Tom looked down at her with a serious expression. Jensen, if I really thought that you would or could, I'd have put this knife in you before you had the chance. Jensen smiled. Good, I'll ride with you then. My horse is up there, she said, pointing up past the pillars of creation. I've become good friends with Rusty. Age 553. Betty bleated at the sound of the horse's name. Jensen laughed and scratched Betty's fat middle. You remember Rusty? Betty bleated that she did as her kids frolicked nearby. In the distance behind, Jensen could hear the murdering Oba Rall demanding to be let out. She stopped and looked back, realizing that he too was a half-brother, a very evil one. I'm sorry I thought such terrible things about you, she said, looking up at Richard. He smiled as he held Kalen close with one arm and then pulled Jensen close with the other. You used your head when confronted with the truth. I couldn't ask for any more than that. The weight of the rock that had fallen was slowly crushing the sandstone boulders holding up the pillar trapping Oba. It was only a matter of hours until Oba was crushed to death in his inescapable prison, or, if not, until he died of thirst. After such a defeat, the Keeper wasn't going to reward Oba with any help. The Keeper would have eternity to make Oba suffer for failure. Oba was a killer. Jensen suspected that Richard Rall had no shred of mercy for someone like that, or anyone who hurt Kalen. He showed Oba none. Oba Rall would be buried forever with the pillars of creation. Chapter 61 In the morning, Tom gave them a ride out among the towering pillars of creation. The view in the early morning with the sun throwing long shadows and lending striking colors to the landscape, was spectacular. It was a sight that no one else had ever come out of the valley to report. Rusty was happy to see Jensen and turned positively frisky when she saw Betty and her two kids. Jensen, with Richard and Kalen at her side, went into the squat building and discovered that Sebastian, unable to reconcile his beliefs and his feelings, had granted Jensen her last wish. He had taken all the mountain fever roses he'd had in the tin. He sat dead at the table. Jensen, sitting beside Tom, listened to Richard and Kalen explain the whole story of how they came to be together. Jensen could hardly believe that he was so much different than she had ever thought. His mother, having been raped by Dark and Rawl, had run away with Zed to protect Richard. Richard grew up far away in Westland, not knowing anything at all about Dahara, or the House of Rall, or magic. Richard had ended the evil rule of Dark and Rall. Kalen, having been hunted by real quads, had killed their commander. With Richard as Lord Rall, there were no more quads. Jensen felt proud and honored now that Richard had asked her to keep the knife with the ornate letter R on it. He said she had earned the right to carry it. She intended to keep it and hold sacred its true purpose. 
Now she truly was a protector, just like Tom. As they rode along, Betty stood in the wagon beside Friedrich, with her front hooves up on the seat between Tom and Jensen, each holding a sleeping little goat. Rusty was tied behind, where Betty frequently went back to visit. Richard, Kalen, and Kara rode along at the side. Jensen turned to her brother after having considered what he'd just told her. So you're not making that up then? It really said that about me in that book, The Pillars of Creation? It was speaking about those like you. The most dangerous creature walking the world of life is the ungifted child of a Lord Rall because they are completely immune to magic. Magic can't harm them, can't affect them, and even prophecy is blind to them. But I guess you turned out to prove the book wrong. She thought it over. Some of it still didn't make sense to her. I don't understand why the keeper was using me. Why was his voice in my head? Well, I only had time to translate a small bit of the book, and other parts are damaged. But from some of what I did read, I guess that the ungifted child, since he has no magic, is what the book calls a hole in the world, Richard explained. So they're also a hole in the veil, making you potentially a conduit between the world of life and the world of the dead. In order for the keeper to consume the world of life, he needed such a gateway. The need for vengeance was the final key. Your surrender to his wishes, when you went out in the woods with the Sisters of the Dark, had to be consummated by you being slain, by you completing the bargain with death by dying. So, if anyone had killed me, Sister Perdita, for example, after I went out in the woods with those Sisters of the Dark, wouldn't that have opened such a gateway? No, the Keeper needed a protector of the world of life. It took the balance to your lack of the gift. It took a gifted Rall, the Lord Rall, to accomplish such a thing, Richard said. If I had killed you to save myself or Kalin, then the Keeper would have been loosed into this world through the breach created. I had to force you to choose life, not death, if you were to live, and if the Keeper was to be kept in the underworld. I might have destroyed life, Jensen said, shaken at truly understanding how close she'd come to unleashing cataclysmic destruction. I'd not have let you, Tom said good-naturedly. Jensen put her hand on his arm, realizing that she had never had feelings before like she had for him. The man positively made her heart sing. His smile made her life worth living. Betty stuck her nose in, wanting attention, and to see her sleeping babies. There is no greater treason to life than delivering the innocent to the keeper of the dead, Kara said. But she didn't, Richard said. She used reason to discover the truth and truth to embrace life. You sure know a lot about magic, Jensen said to Richard. Kalen and Kara laughed so hard that Jensen thought they might fall off their horses. I don't see what's so funny, Richard grumbled. The two of them laughed all the harder. End of The Pillars of Creation The Sword of Truth, Book 7 By Terry Goodkind Read by Nick Sullivan